And so what 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 is so provocative about him having this diary and writing down his memories and his thoughts? Um, what what is so unusual about what he's doing? Any thoughts about that? Okay, so Jim has an idea, the very idea that he's creating records, right? And that's a very good way of thinking about that because partly what he's doing is, I mean, there's a couple different related things, but he's creating a record of his own personal existence independent of the system of record keeping of the state or, or of Oceania and, and its control, right? And this is very provocative because they can, I mean, the one thing you notice about the media today, if you follow like cable news, is they constantly talk about narratives. And you know you're in for trouble when you have the media talking about narratives, because a narrative is a story. And a story, as we established at the beginning of the semester, is not necessarily the truth. It's just what people say, right? And the, the media even talks about things like narrative control and the narrative cycle and the news cycle. They acknowledge that what they're doing is not simply presenting you facts so that you can reach your own conclusions about what things mean and what their significance is. They acknowledge that they're shaping the facts by putting them in a story that maybe misrepresents those facts. So one of the central dimensions of control in 1984 is you could call it narrative control. They, they control the stories that people have access to. And of course, um, I mean, think about what we said myth is. Myth explains who we are, where we came from. Uh, it explains what this world is all about and what our relationship to it is. It answers these fundamental questions. And the big thing about myth is it's not entertainment. It's something, it, it may be entertaining, it may be enjoyable, it, it may be pleasurable, but it serves a much more fundamental function um, in uh, the formation of human society and the formation of the individual's character and point of view, which is to say the, the, the basic myths, the stories we tell about the what, what we're doing in this world, they, they shape our outlook on the world, right? And the, the basic function of uh, this regime in 1984 is by controlling the narrative, they control and limit the perspective of the characters uh, or the, the subjects of the regime uh, so that they can control them more easily. And to put it really simply, on one hand, they just keep them in a state of ignorance about what the truth is. Uh, and second, it may be even more complicated than that. They're, they're determined to confuse the people about what, what the reality that they're living in actually is. And of course, one of the funny things they do is they change stories from one to the other, and they literally like contradict themselves from one day to the next. And you're supposed to just, for, and this is where the idea of double think comes in, that one day they said this and it was true. And then the next day they said this, which was the opposite thing, and it was true too. And actually, if you look at our own media, the, our media has done that where they've just said things and then they just change their story the next day and they expect you to act as if you, uh, as if you're not aware that what they said yesterday completely contradicts what they're saying now, and that you're just a kind of moron, and that you're there to just have this these these narratives downloaded in your head without any critical thinking, right? So, and and this this record keeping, and I like the the word Jim uses here of keeping a record. This record keeping that um, uh, Winston is engaged in is something personal. It's about his own life because he's trying to make sense of his own existence. He knows that there's something off in this society. Um, if you're familiar with the movie, The Matrix, where they're living in this dystopian virtual reality that's a false reality, um, Keanu Reeves character, Neo, um, somehow becomes aware that the world he's living in, that he's taken for granted up to this point, he realizes there's something wrong with it. He realizes it's not the whole picture. It's not the whole truth or it's not the truth at all. 
And Winston is a character who's become uh, aware of that rift between his own point of view and the point of view that the regime is trying to instill in him. And I mean, this makes him a unique character within the context of his society. He's not a genius. He's not like some larger than life heroic figure. He's very much a, a, an ordinary kind of middle of the road person, but he does have a, a certain level of intellect and understanding and um, perceptiveness about the world he's in that that allows him to be slightly different from most of the people. You notice like his his neighbors are just blinkered. They're, they're totally, they've totally digested the lies of the society and they, they, fo they follow the rules um, in a kind of like a, a zombie, almost a zombie-like way, a, a robotic way, and they've internalized them and they've accepted them, and Winston clearly hasn't. So, what? Why? Why is Winston different? What? What has he been aware of? Well, one thing he does is work at the Ministry of Truth, right? And he's he's seen how the sausage is made, right? What What does Winston actually do at the Ministry of Truth? What is his job on a daily basis? So Cynthia says to write about the news. Kind of, but we have to be more specific. So what does he do? So basically he changed facts that happen in history and um, line it up according to what the party wants. Yeah, so there's a central truth to this world, which is that uh, reality is not what's true. Uh, the physical world is not what's true. What you see with your own lying eyes is not what's true. What's true is what the party says is true. And at any point when they decide for convenience sake in order to better control the society, when they change what's true, uh, 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 th they determine what's true at all times. So what, is, what does Winston do? He takes stories that have been published in the newspapers that, that start to become like the first draft of history. Like the classic line about journalism is that it's the quote unquote first draft of history. So uh, the newspapers serve a historical function in terms of being a record of what ha what's happened. So he doesn't exactly write the news. I mean, he does, but, but what he's actually doing is taking old newspapers and modifying them and changing the past, right? So there's this whole line that, um, you know, uh, he, he, he who controls the present controls the past and he who controls the past controls the future really important line because how do we understand who we are as individuals and as a society uh, through our own past? And if we don't have access to the truth of our past, we can't possibly understand ourselves correctly. And it's going to literally change who we are. So he's got, you know, this teletype where he types things up and he edits things and he changes names and he changes pictures to suit the needs of the party at any given moment, they decide. And, and the, he, he talks about two funny instances in him changing the newspapers. There, there's one instance where ostensibly the facts that he's changing were actually true. They actually happened that way. And then there are other instances where things have been changed so much that nobody, lo, lo, nobody no longer knows what the actual truth that's been changed. So what you're changing is actually old lies for new lies, right? And he's got this thing called the memory hole. So literally it's, he's, he's working in a kind of old fashioned way. Today it would all be done on a computer, right? But he's got physical newspapers where he clips things out and pastes things and so on and so forth. And when he clips out an old bit of information that the party doesn't want the people to have access to, he clips it out and throws it into this thing called the memory hole. And so that memory uh, vanishes. So, so the big thing is, you you know that you're living in a lie, but the pro and you know everyone in the society has an awareness that that, that what they're being told is is not necessarily the truth. 
The problem is what this society does is destroy all evidence of the past and produces only the evidence they want to confirm the certain narrative that they want to present at that given time. Right. So if you want, if you said to yourself, it's all a pack of lies and I'm going to get at the truth, the problem is there would be nowhere to turn to. Uh, there are no, you need physical objects to record, you need firsthand evidence, right? You need something concrete, not just your, your memories are deceptive, right? So they destroy everything that they don't want to be uh, uh, seen by uh, the members of this regime. Uh, for things that come from the past. So even if you tried to recollect or understand what really happened, you wouldn't be able to do it because it's non-existent, right? They kind of wipe the slate clean. And the expression, the memory hole has become like a, a working term that people use a lot to describe things that the media do today where they, ra they raise a topic and it's very important for like a week and then it just gets thrown down the memory hole and they act like they've never talked about it at all. And it's, it's, it's quite rather bizarre. Um, and so what he's doing in uh, his own work deals with history, right? Uh, and what's actually happening and the lies they're telling, he actually sees the sausage being made, right, of, um, of this uh, government uh, actually changing the, you know, the narrative. So he's aware of it going on because he's actually involved in it. So what's the function of the, what's the function of the diary? It's not about the history of Oceania. What, what is the diary about? What is he what is he concerned to do with this diary? Oh, he's concerned to write in it and um his 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 memories, his thoughts, his feelings. Good. Why does he want to write in it? What what's the function for him? What's the value for him? Um he's not sure. Um but... Okay, good. He 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 he's got this like groping inkling. Uh, and an impulse, right? What What do you think? What do you think ultimately writing in the diary is about? Well, I know for a fact that later on he decides that it's going to be for the future, but mainly for O'Brien. The diary. Okay, yeah, and it ends up being like a kind of confession, ironically. Yeah, it's going to be the future because uh, the past informs the future because the future is a big X, it's an unknown. And the past is what you, well, if, if there is something you know, it's something about the past because you've experienced it. Um, I think there's a couple different reasons, probably two main reasons why he's writing in this book. Yes, yeah, so I agree with what he does. He writes about, he tries to recollect his past. Why is that so crucial to him? Any thoughts, Cynthia? So he says, you, you said he, he wants to remember the past. Why is that relevant? That Why does he? Way, I, that I was mean, he like self-expressed himself. Pardon? Um, that was like a way that he self-expressed himself with his diary. I definitely agree. But I think what he's doing is is a little more or a little different than what we would think of as just self-expression. What is he trying, why, first of all, why does he have to remember his past? I mean, doesn't he know his past? Doesn't he, doesn't he know what's happened in his own life? I mean, he does, but because of double thinking, you know, they're trying to, ha um, they're trying to, um, they don't, um, the, what do you call, the party doesn't want them to remember the past. So okay, good. I, and, and what have they done to make it really difficult for him to remember his own personal past? By trying to control um, 
what he's thinking and like his, from his job and what's actually going on in his surroundings. Okay. Yeah. So let's start with that through the control of language and the elimination of words. I mean, even words that uh, he would have once used uh, are now no longer in fashion. And you become aware that when he was a child, that basically there really wasn't newspeak really wasn't into existence and he he spoke you know old old speak he spoke proper english right um so there's a whole series of of cognitive techniques with the control of language that starts to cut off your access to your own past because you don't have the words at your disposal and you don't have the concepts because if you don't have the words you don't have the concepts um also so we've just an, another thing someone said uh, you know, if you change the events of the past, well, how do you understand your own history in reference to events that you no longer have access to? I don't know. So let's say, you know, everybody says, I knew where I was and exactly what I was doing when I heard JFK died, or I knew exactly where I was and what I was doing and how I felt when 9-11 happened. Well, what if, what, what if the US government came along and said, 9-11 never happened? And, and, and not only did they change a newspaper or an, an internet article, but they changed things physically so there was no physical evidence, no reference to this event ever happening. Um, you would know something's not right, but you, how, how would you show to anyone else uh, what it was like for you when, when all those markers, all those indices of that event and the feelings connected with them, the thoughts connected with them were, were taken away. It, it starts to illustrate the extent to which our identities, number one, are the product of memory and how we understand our own past. But number two, that our past is rooted in a lot of physical things that we need to have reference points to. You think about people just putting up pictures in their household or keeping trinkets that they have from the past or even, even junk stuff that goes in the attic or the basement uh, that you don't use anymore that somehow for whatever reason you don't part with. All these things are little uh, mnemonic receptacles for past memories. And uh, when, when you see them physically, they help you to recall the memory with sometimes a lot of fidelity. And of course, they're, they're, they're evidence that that thing happened to you. It's like you took a picture of yourself, I don't know, uh, uh, on the Brooklyn Bridge or something with some friends. I was there, I was with them, it happened. And the moment that that picture is gone in this world, they can say, that never happened. Prove it to me that it happened. And there's, there's no evidence of it, right? So um, he's under. He, he, he seeks to understand the true history of Oceania because he's aware of the false history precisely because he's the one who changes it. He's one, at least one of the workers. I mean, he's just doing his job. He's not like in control of anything he's doing. And then he wants to recollect his own life because all the kind of physical markers of it have been extricated. They've, they, they've been eliminated. They've been destroyed, right? I mean, honestly, if you think about what our society is doing with like trying to cancel certain people from our historical past, um, uh, tear down their sculptures and, and make them seem like they don't exist. There's something very strange going on. If you have a problem with a figure from the past because they were a slave owner or because they were part of European imperialism, it would think it would seem to me that the natural thing to do is precisely to learn about that person so you can actually understand that if you believe they committed evils and injustices, you actually understand the evils and injustices that they committed. So you can say, let's not ever ha have this happen again, or let's keep moving away from this, this, this blemish on our history. But by eliminating them and making them seem like they didn't exist, you're, you're like eliminating, um, uh, you know, the, the very thing from memory. You're, you're not eliminating it in reality. It's, it still happened. And uh, it, it seems totally contrary to, to what you would actually want to do uh, to 
and because it seems like some of the real motive is to uh, eliminate our history quite quite simply. Um, I mean, if you think about what the New York Times did, I guess it was meant now about a year and a half, almost two years ago, it seems, with the whole 1619 project, where they claim that the United States of America was founded in 1619 when the first slaves came here. Um, it's one of the most preposterous things uh, that you could ever imagine because in 1619, there was no United States. There was no Declaration of Independence. There was no constitution. There was no American government. We were British colonies and everything that happened here was a product of British control. And there was no identity of the United States of America then. Um, and, and, you know, the, the focus was to say that the country was founded in slavery and racism, right? Which is profoundly contrary to the actual founding of our country, which didn't happen until, you know, almost 100, basically 150 years later. Uh, under very different circumstances. Um, so the, the diary becomes crucial for him creating a space of thought independent from the regime and also uh, to recollect his own history. Uh, so last question here, and then we'll move on to something else here. Why, why is he so concerned to recollect his own true history? Why is that so important to him? I mean, I think we all sit there and say, obviously that's important to us. We feel something like that kind of endeavor is important to um, be in touch with um, you know, our own past experiences. Why, why do you think that's so important to him? To know him. what really happened in his life. It allows him to like track everything that was going on in the world. Yeah, I think the two are connected because the events of his life are obviously interconnected with the life of the, the history of this world he's living in. Right. And both of them are rather mysterious to him. Why do we let, let's just stick his own personal. Why, why is he so concerned to resurrect his own personal history? I think there's more than one answer. I think there's is is an open-ended question. It serves as it serves as like a symbol of what? Uh, you mean you mean his past life serves as a symbol? Yeah. Of of what? Uh, I'm not sure. Any other thoughts? Why, what, why, why would one of you be so concerned with your own, you know, personal history, and maybe recording it in a diary? Um, maybe because you want to leave a mark. You want to leave legacy behind for the new generation. Maybe just you want you want proof and physical evidence of what took place, so you can you can um, tell people about it with facts. Okay, that that's one good observation. Think of how unnerving it is in this society. You know something happened. You saw it with your own eyes, but the society has removed every bit of evidence that it ever happened, and your mind is like boggled because. You, you, you were sure it happened, but you can't point to anything to say definitively that's the way it was, right? Because, I mean, part of the logic, it's not just that this society lies. One, one of the things that they're, one of the main goals is to constantly change the truth. And it keeps these people in this kind of netherworld. They, they don't know what to make of the world they're in. So, so that's one, one thing to, to be able to have some concrete, uh, like a point of reference, like the Archimedean point that holds up the rest of the world. He also wants to remember his family. Yeah, why does he care about that? 
I th I think you guys know the answer to a good, to a good, good bit of this question. Why why does he want to write about his own life? Oh, so he, he wants to know about his family. He wants to know what happened to his family because he becomes aware that things happened to his family and he's not totally clear about what. So he can basically remember who he is. Ah, yeah. I think this is what it's really about. Um, who is Winston Smith, right? One way to think of him, at, just as the way we might think of ourselves, the accumulated experience of one's personal history. That's who you are. If you are cut off from your own personal history, you are cut off from your identity. You are cut off from your essence because you are the, the accumulation of all those experiences, right? In the same way, a nation uh, or a community of people is their, their history. It's the accumulate, because uh, history is not just stuff on paper, right? History is what's actually happened. It's what people have lived. It's what they felt. It's what they believed. Right. So I think he has a deep concern to understand who he is, because it seems to be that one of the way uh, this one of the ways this society controls people is simply through suppressing their identity, both collectively and individually, by cutting them off from from their own history. I mean, your history is what's dear to you. E even if your history was imperfect, bad, bad things happened to you in your youth. It's still it's what happened to you. And, it, and it, it's what makes you, you. And to have it severed from you is, is rather disconcerting. A any other thoughts uh, as, to, as to why he's concerned? I think there is one other more general thing. Let's put it this way. Is he satisfied with the lies of this society? No, he's not. No, so he has a concern for the truth. And you can see very clearly that the other characters don't necessarily have, his neighbors don't have a concern for the truth. Even Julia, she doesn't really care so much. I mean, uh, Winston gets caught up in what becomes a, a political struggle. He is, I mean, he doesn't seem much like a revolutionary. He's not like Che Guevara with you know, the hat on and everything. But uh, he realizes he's fundamentally dissatisfied and that he can't live that way. And that he needs, to, he needs for himself because of his own nature to live with the truth and to search and to pursue for the truth. And this is connected with like an act of justice because it's the very thing that's denied them. And of course, Julia has very different, different motives. Okay, so what I wanna look at now is the the two minutes hate that's part of the hate week that's part of a whole strategy of divide and conquer because one of the fascinating things we see in this text is the way in which uh the this how should i put it not the rules the the, the control of the regime manifests psychologically and in impersonal relationships we always think of politics as something impersonal and something very distant from our immediate lives. And that has a lot to do with the type of regime we live in, where we have a private existence, where the, the government, well, for the most part, uh, things are changing all the time, for the most part stays out of. But a totalitarian regime seeps into every aspect, uh, every nook and cranny of somebody's life, their psychological life between their ears and their emotional life, and also their relationships with other people. So we see this interesting, uh, uh, the, the power structure of the regime play out in his relationship with this girl, Julia, right? So why don't we read, let me get this thing up. Let me just, yeah. So here, we're, on, we're just on page nine. And you notice the first thing we get introduced to in this text after he's written these words in the, um, in the diary is, is a discussion of hate week. And then we get thrown into 
uh, you, you might even call it the ritual of, of hate week and what, what that's all about. So could I, could I have somebody read for us here, starting, starting right here, it, it was? Who would like to read for us a little bit? I'll read, Professor. Go for it, Ellie Esther. It was nearly 1100 in the records department where Winston worked. They were dragging the chairs out of the cubicles and grouping them in the center of the hall. Opposite the big telescreen in preparation for the two minute team, Winston was just taking his place in one of the middle rows when the two people he knew by sight, but had never spoken to, came unexpectedly into the room. One of them was a girl whom he often passed in the corridors. He did not know her name, but he knew that she worked in the fiction department. Presumably, she, since he had sometimes seen her with oily hands and carrying a spanner, she has some mechanical job one on the novel writing, writing machines. She was a bold looking girl of, of about 27 with thick dark hair, a freckled face, swift athletic movements, a narrow scarlet sash, and a bloom of the junior, of the junior anti-sex league was wounded several times around the waist of her overalls, just tightly enough to bring out the shapeliness of her lip, of her hips. Okay, when she great. had- So he sees during the, the period of the two minute hate, Two minutes hate. Winston sees this girl with dark hair and fair skin, and she's carrying a, a, a spanner, which is like a ranch, you know, it's a British word for a ranch. So she's like a worker, and it's got this kind of reference to Marxist, you know, the workers, workers of the world unite. And they all wear like these plain overalls, so they're not distinguished from one another. They're all the same. Uh, and uh, they're-, they're Come here. And um, and you, you notice, for example, she's part of the Junior Anti-Sex League. We'll have to come back to that in a second, because actually sex and sexual relations becomes a really instrumental part of the, the story being told here. The way in which this regime shapes people's sexual life. Uh, to, to um, first, first of all, sorry. Who, who is being described here? Because you notice her name is not given. It's just some girl he sees across the room that he's fascinated by. Who is this? Julia. Would it have to be Julia? Good, good, good. good. Everybody's got. It. So Julia, this is the girl that he's going to have this relationship with, right? And he's going to go, they're going to set up these clandestine meetings at above Mr. Sherrington's bookstore, uh, which is the place where he bought the diary. And the interesting thing about the book, so we see that, you know, Winston likes the written, he likes language, he likes words. Um, he's, he's, a, he's involved in the liberal arts and the, the, the arts of the mind. Um, he, he likes language, uh, he likes books and he likes the physicality of the books. And he's kind of old fashioned in this way. Um, and there's a certain, uh, even a kind of romanticism to language and books for him. So they, they take a room above Mr. Sherrington's um, bookstore where they carry out their liaison, uh, kind of under the premise like they're escaping from the system and they're not going to be seen. But of course there is, you know, there's typically, you know, surveillance everywhere. And of course, uh, well, does anyone, did anyone, what what happens at the end of book two? What happens to them? They get caught in the room. Yeah, they get caught. And and who is the person who 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 basically informed on them, right? If you know anything about the Soviet Union. You know that one of its great stress, and this is really interesting. I read a great article on this academic article. Uh, they said, you know, you'd think that in the Soviet Union there was all this tremendous centralized government control. We talked about the centralization, the concentration of power last class, no checks and balances, and no federalism, and all this stuff like in our constitution. 
is that you think that centralized power and this like massive state apparatus was the primary vehicle to control people in the Soviet Union. And he says, actually, well, there's some truth to that, but one thing they did was to empower ordinary citizens with the power of law so that they could inform on their fellow citizens and give them a sense of power over their over their fellow citizens. So people would be put in charge of like surveilling their friends, their family, uh, and people were played off against one another. So it serves a, a, a double purpose of surveillance, but then also of setting society against itself by certain people being able to inform and, and getting kind of status for having done it. So Sherrington, who is supposed to be this innocent, you know, like older guy who runs a used bookstore, you think just kind of the, uh, a nice guy who likes books, turns out to be the guy who informed on them. And, and it even describes that, you know, basically he's been in a disguise the whole time. And, it, and it's almost like this room that they've taken was, um, uh, it was a kind of like a trap from the very beginning and that they've probably been surveilled from the, from the very beginning. Okay, S got it, Eliester. So, so they have, so they have, uh, uh, you know, uh, that, that's the ending of uh, their relationship. Um, what's this whole stuff about Julia being part of the junior anti-sex league? And what is the whole mentality about sex as the regime promotes like their understanding of sex or their attitude towards sex what what is what is the anti sex league about and what what is what is the regime promote in terms of sexual relations okay yeah so jim says sex is a duty to be done. And so particularly when we look at Winston talking about the relationship with his wife, Catherine, we'll see that she sees herself as like, she's almost like a soldier of the regime doing her duty by producing, you know, trying to uh, pr produce a child um, for, for the society. Yeah, the, it's Julia who likes to break the rules. So, so sex is a duty. Anything else we want to say about their attitude towards sex? What are the things that are kind of forbidden with sex? What, what are the kinds of things that are not encouraged? No intimacy, no feeling. Yeah. So, I mean, it's Julie is a very strange figure because she's part of this anti sex league that's like against sex. On the other hand, she sleeps with party officials and gets them compromised. And she's kind of a honeypot. That's kind of the role she plays. Stuff you actually can read about these days happening to people like the Jeffrey Epstein stuff. Um, and so, I mean, she seems to have a powerful carnal desire that is unusual in this society, but even she doesn't seem to have the kind of emotional sensitivity that Winston has. And of course, Winston's wife has, has no emotional sensitivity at all. So, I mean, they, they try to confine sex. They, they try to denigrate sex. Uh, and disassociate sex from emotional intimacy. And of course, you know, there's like a whole pornography department to kind of desensitize people. Um, and for, for the most part, they, they try to turn people off from sex. And uh, it's not just his writing in the book or the diary that becomes, you might call it a revolutionary act within the context of the society. Uh, or it, at the very least a rebellious act. But clearly his relationship with Julia is an act of rebellion because what he's concerned with is the genuine expression of feeling and emotion and having this space of intimacy 
uh, away from the regime and uh, it, its kind of tentacles in the same way that that diary is um, uh, a, a space, he's, a, a psychic space uh, of thought and feeling that he's trying to create separate from the tentacles of the regime. And of course, the reason it's hard to create these spaces is precisely because of the surveillance. So the surveillance prevents people from establishing kind of their own private world, right? And that helps to control them. And you see one of the big provocations, and I think if we wrote this book today, we write it a little differently in terms of the treatment of sex. Um, so the one thing they discourage is pleasure and they foment hatred and distance and kind of coldness between people. And they try to disassociate sex from pleasure. They make sex a duty and therefore seeking intimacy and pleasure in sex becomes a great kind of, you could say a act of a rebellion or a revolutionary act. That's, that's really important to see that element uh, of what's going on here. Um, but I have a question. If you're writing this book today and you wanted to control people through manipulating uh, our, 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 our psychology connected with sex or um, the sexual dynamics of relationships, what, what would you do today if you wanted to control society? What, would, you make, would you make sex so uh, uh, forbi forbidden and uh, in this way? What, what does our society do with sex? What does Cardi B do with sex? Jim says advertise it. Anyone want to make it public? She promotes it. Yeah. So this, so there's an interesting dynamic in the society that um, uh, Orwell is very sensitive to portray. All of these characters, they're kind of sexually repressed because the society discourages the thoughts of sexual intimacy, emotional intimacy, uh, and it turns them off to sex in the way his wife is really actually disgusted by the sexual act, right? And what is the result of it? All these people have this tremendous buildup of psychic energy because they don't have a sexual outlet. And so question, how does all that energy that they have built up in them get channeled? What does it get channeled into? Hate me? Yes, and let's just say hate. So feelings that might otherwise manifest as love and intimacy, they try to redirect them through their codes and boundaries about sex and channel them into hate. And they have to have hate. Hate becomes really important because they have all this kind of psychic energy that needs an outlet, right? And so the outlet goes against the enemies of the regime uh, that they're fighting in the war. And also Emmanuel Goldstein, the great Jewish traitor. There's this kind of anti-Semitic motif at work here. Um, <clears throat> as the guy who tried to like rebel against the system and failed. And he's he's the kind of, just as Big Brother is the face of the regime, Emmanuel Goldstein is like the face of, you know, the ultimate enemy of the regime. So he, here's one problem with, with Newspeak and the rules they've created around sex is that, the, uh, you know, Winston doesn't understand the feelings he's having for Julia because he doesn't have the language of intimacy. And without the language of intimacy, he doesn't have the feelings of intimacy. He doesn't have the concepts that would produce the feelings. So he has these very, the, the first time he sees her, he, he takes note of her. And as you read, you realize he's actually being attracted to her and um, uh, is kind of, um, you know, this vision of this girl. Uh, and at the same time, he, it, it's like a little boy in school that he, he, you know, has a thing for a girl, but it only manifests as, as, 
as him being like rude to her because he doesn't know how else to act. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like, <laughs> Winston doesn't have the the emotional vocabulary at his disposal uh, to to show warmth, and of course that's not his fault. That's a product of the society, and you can see very clearly then how that's a function, uh, a control function, which is to say it's part of divide and conquer. All right, El Ellie Esther, are you back? Yeah, Professor, I'm back. Okay, why don't you keep going? Okay. Winston had disliked her from the very moment of seeing her. He knew the reason. It was because of the atmosphere of hockey fields and cold baths and community hikes in the general. General clean mindedness. And the general clean mindedness, which he had managed to carry about with him. He disliked nearly all of the women and especially the young and pretty ones. He okay, had always let's pause right there. Does he really dislike them? No. No, I think actually he's attracted to them and he, he you know, he he finds them appealing. but the only language he has at his disposal, disposal is dislike and hate. Mm -hmm. right? And therefore it manifests also that way in his feelings, right? And oh, what, what would we do in our society if we wanted to control everybody? We would liberate the sexual impulse. We would like take sex out of the bedroom and make it as public as possible. We'd put as much pornography out there as possible. We'd uh, say, you know, to hell with monogamy, to hell with the family. If you have an impulse to have sex, go and do it, right? I mean, you would do the opposite, right? And you you would take all, all the uh, power out of it by doing that. And so ironically, by restricting sex here, um, at least for Winston, who's this perceptive character, um, it's actually made sex and intimacy very provocative for him because it's that classic thing that the thing that you can't have is the thing that uh, cre cre uh, grabs your attention, right? All right, you want to keep going, Ellie Esther? Yeah. It was always the women and above, above all the young ones who were the most bigoted adherents of the party, the swallowers of slogans, the amateur spice and nosers out of orthodoxy. But this particular girl gave him the impression of him being more dangerous than most. Once when they passed into the corridor, she had given him a quick side along glance, which seemed to pierce right into him and for a moment had filled him with black terror. The idea had a, the idea had even crossed his mind that she might be an agent of the thought police. That it was true was very unlikely. Still, he continued to feel a particular uneasiness which had fear mixed up in it as well as hostility, as hostility whenever she was anywhere near him. Okay, so uh, dislike, fear, and hostility. That, that's his only emotional kind of vocabulary for reacting to the provocation of her presence, her appearance, the way she carries herself. Uh, he fears that she is an agent of the thought police. Mm -hmm. What's the answer to that question? Why does she end up engaging in this relationship? Um. Remember what she explicitly says later on. She explicitly says that, um, you know, she, she went with party members and then they got in trouble precisely for, you know, being seduced by her. What, what happens when they both get sent to the Ministry of Love? What do you mean, what happens? Well, I mean, is she just a kind of honeypot to get uh, Winston in trouble from the very beginning? Or does she have genu genuine feelings for him? I think a little bit of both. Okay, good. So. Remember, they're both trapped in this system. Uh, mm -hmm. If she is some kind of connected with the thought police, she's doing it because that's what she's stuck doing. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so th this is a real bittersweet uh, dynamic where it seems likely that she actually was there to set him up. Uh, and at the same time, she obviously has uh, feelings uh, for him because she, 
it, you know, she turns out to be one of the women who's in touch with her own kind of sexual, uh, I don't know, identity or impulse, right? And um, it, it's it's something that actually liberates her from, you know, the, the confines of the regime because it allows her to connect with other people and maybe also her, herself, right? Okay, why don't we keep going here? Yeah. The other person was a name was a man named O'Brien, a member of the inner party and a holder of some post so important and remote that Winston had only a dim idea idea of its nature. A monetary hush passed over the group around the chairs as they saw the black overalls of an inner party member approaching. O'Brien was a large, burly man with a thick neck and coarse, humorous, brutal face. In spite of his hormid formidable appearance, he had a certain amount of charm and of manner. He had a trick of resettling his spectacles on his nose, on his nose, which was curiously dis disarming in some indefinable way, curiously civilized. It was a gesture which, uh, which uh, it was a gesture which if anyone has so thought in such terms might have called an A- An eighteenth, an eighteenth century noble nobleman offering his snuff buff. Winston had seen O'Brien perhaps a dozen a dozen times in almost as many years. He felt deeply drawn to him, and not solely because he was intrigued by the contrast of be between O'Brien's urban manner and his prize fighter's physique. Much more, it was because of his secretly held belief, or perhaps not even be not even belief merely a hope that O'Brien's political orthodoxy was not perfect. Something in his face suggested it was irresistibly. And again, perhaps it might not, not even orthodoxy that was written in his face, but simply intelligent. But at any rate, he had the appearance of being a person that you could talk to if some if somehow you could cheat the telescreen and get and get him alone. Winston had never made the smallest effort to verify his, his guess. Indeed, there was no way of doing so. At this moment, O'Brien glanced at his wristwatch, saw that it was nearly 1100, and evidently decided to stay in the records department until the two minutes hate was over. He took a chair in the same row as Winston, a couple of places away. A small, sandy-haired woman who worked in the next cuticle, next cuticle to Winston was between them. The girl with dark hair was sitting immediately behind. The next woman was hideous, grinding speech as of some monstrous machine running without oil burst from the big telescreen and at the end of the room. It was a noise that said on one's teeth on edge, bristled the hair at the back of one's neck, the hate had started. As usual, the face of Emmanuel Goldstein, the enemy. Okay, great, great. So two things here. <clears throat> what exactly is says the hate capital H? This is the two minutes hate had started, and then the face of Emmanuel Goldstein. What what does this uh, two minutes hate actually consist of? Isn't it dumb like watching some sort of like a film, um, and then they portray hate towards like their enemy afterwards? Yeah, so they they watch they watch footage on the telescreen of you know the enemy combatants in the war or the supposed war that they're in uh, with the other continents. Um, there's uh, Eurasia and East Asia, right? And then Emmanuel Goldstein, who's like the enemy within, who tried to subvert the you know the regime and got caught, and um, so it directs all their hate. So literally what they do, what do they do while they're looking at the screen? They're screaming with rage. Yeah, and it and it's got this kind of Pavlovian thing where, you know, the whole story with uh, Pavlov, the scientist with the dog, is that um, he would ring a bell and then he would feed the dog and the food would appear. He'd ring the bell and the food would show up. So then when he would ring the bell, the dog would start to salivate before the food even got there because he got trained with the association between the bell and the food coming. Um, so here, the, what they're doing is just habituating these people to, the, to, to hating these images and to responding 
in just a kind of need a, a knee jerk way. That, I mean, they're, they're acting almost like automatons in doing this. And of course, the part of the strategy here is, um, you know, to stoke feelings of hate rather than empathy and intimacy and real comradeship and love and all these things. Uh, so that's one thing that they they cultivate hate rather than love. Um, think about it, it's like the the antithesis of the message of Jesus or Gandhi, something something like that. And then the other thing is, obviously, deep down, all these members of this society, they must have a you know deep hatred and frustration of the life they're living because it's it's so contrary to their own, own human nature that it, it must make them uh, profoundly unhappy and upset and angry. But here, all the anger, instead of getting directed toward the real oppressors, gets directed toward a kind of phantom uh, enemy, right? Um, yeah. Uh, so why don't we, we get a little more of the two minutes eight here. Eliester, could you pick up at the bottom of this page? Yeah. In a second, minute the hate rose to a frenzy people were leaping up and down their plate their places and shouting at the top of the voices in an effort to drown the maddening bleeding bleeding voice voice that came from the screen the little sandy haired woman had turned bright pink and her mouth was opening and shutting like that of a landed fish even o'brien's face was flushed he was sitting very straight in his chair his powerful chest was swelling and quivering as though he were standing up to the assault of a wave. The okay, dark let's, just, let's just pause one second. We need to ask, uh, who, who is O'Brien? What, what is he all about? He's presented here in this very elusive way as just a guy uh, who uh, Winston sees across the, the room as this two minutes hate goes on. And they like exchange glances. Who is O'Brien? Does does Winston know who O'Brien is? He's a member of the inner party. Yeah, so there's a tremendous ambiguity about his exact position, but it seems to be by the end of the book that he's a it becomes clear he's a member of the inner party, right? What what it, what is Winston's impression of him here? Because this is important. He thinks that O'Brien has the right, the same mindset that he has. Like he believes that O'Brien is on the same page as him. Yeah, good. Re very good. So, so the first thing is we, we know that phenomena where we see in others what we understand in ourselves. Uh, and so he hopes to see in O'Brien, what he sees in himself, that they're on the same page about something. And so then the question is, what, what is that something that he hopes or thinks or projects? On, he, he projects on O'Brien uh, a, a, a kind of hope or a wish, right? What, what, what is that thing that he projects on O'Brien? What does he feel he has in common with him? Why does he feel simpatico with him? What is, what is it? What is, what is the thing? This is important. He feels that they both hate Big Brother. Okay, good. So, you know, Winston, at some point early on in the text or just before the narrative starts, has had some kind of awakening about the world he's in. And he, 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 he's gotten to some precipice and he's like gone over the edge and that's exemplified in the diary that he's that he committed himself to that act that he knows is going to be his own downfall right so he's like searching for others i mean because he can't do this by himself he 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 wants to talk to other people he wants to um uh not only for the sake of understanding the world he's in, but just for the sake of having common ground with someone else. You see that this whole society is based on kind of distance uh, and um, uh, a sense of um, just, uh, you know, we've said it, a lack of intimacy. So he's, he's craving intimacy. 
and, and it comes out in two forms. He craves uh, the intimacy of Julia because he wants an actual love relationship with a woman, which he's not had. And then the other thing is he wants a kind of- uh, Intelligence from O'Brien, right? Yeah, and a kind of in, intellectual, um, uh, what's intellectual. the right word? That simpatico. I mean, that he, he sees that O'Brien has like a twinkle in his eye. He's not a zombie, right? He's not a robot like many of the other characters are. It's not like Night of the Living Dead. I just watch, is that the one I watched? I, or was it something, Invasions of the Body Snatchers? Yeah, that was an interesting movie. <laughs> um, Anyway, so he looks like a, a sentient being, like he actually has thoughts going through his head. And, you know, obviously part of the society is to kind of brainwash people and mind control them so that they don't think for themselves. Um, you know, you can see that it's powerful parallels with our own society in that regard. And of course, the, the big step is that not only does he see him as sentient, but he sees him as thinking the same things, right? Um, is that true or well first of all is is o'brien intelligent i mean he thinks he is but yeah, yeah didn't i say it in the yeah it said that he was intelligent or intelligent looking yeah well so good i mean i i think you know o'brien there's an intellectual match there. Uh, I mean, O'Brien, um, he, I mean, obviously he understands, we've discovered later in the text, he, he understands a lot about how the regime actually works, right? I mean, remember one of the things here, they're in the dark. Um, what's that great word? Occult, like occult just means like things are concealed um, in mystery. Um, and he's yearning to understand what the mechanism actually is of control, who's really in, in charge, what are their real goals, don't know. That's kind of a little like the world we live in today, I think. Um, some powerful people behind the scenes and we have no clue who they are and what they want to do, what their plans are for the world. Um, and I mean, so, I mean, O'Brien is, it, I mean, is he a genius? It's not relevant, but but he's intelligent and he he uh, can, can identify with Winston on that level. And Winston gets the intimacy of that kind of uh, that, uh, I don't know, intellectual exchange, for lack of a better expression. Um, uh, it is uh, O'Brien looking for revolution, however? No. Definitely not, right? What What is O'Brien's true function? I guess to discover um, people that's against the party. Yeah, and he actually has to do it by being fairly intimate with them to get them to actually divulge what's really going on in their mind. So there is this perverse relationship of of pretty intense intimacy that established that is established between these two men. And I guess it's on page 24. It says, Winston had never been able to feel sure even after this morning's flash of the eyes, it was still impossible to be sure whether O'Brien was a friend or an enemy. So what is a friend or an enemy? But he still liked him, regardless whether he wasn't too sure. Oh yeah, so uh, I mean, uh, emotionally and intellectually, he's he's attached and he's curious, but that mm -hmm. still doesn't change the fact that you know O'Brien might represent a threat to him. So, what's the answer? Is O'Brien a friend or an enemy? Oh, he's an enemy. But I mean, he takes him to the Ministry of Love. But he, he was also honest with him by letting him know that he is part of the inner party, right? Yeah, not only does he reveal the inner party, but like he reveals a lot of information about the regime itself that you're kind of surprised that it's kind of like uh, Winston, uh, for all his curiosity, is given a lot of understanding. And then once he's given the understanding, his own identity is then erased after that. Um, 
So there's this bizarre frenemy relationship that develops. And uh, how long has O'Brien been watching Winston? How much does he know about Winston? Did anyone catch that later on in the book? No, I didn't catch that. Okay, so this, yeah. So it, it turns out that O'Brien is kind of like Winston was his, uh, like a case file for him. And he's been following Winston's life for a long time. And he knows his biography. Think about that. Winston doesn't even know his own biography, but this party member does. That's terrifying. And so just by the fact that O'Brien, as part of his job, is forced to know uh, and become conversant with all these intimate facts about Winston's life, there's definitely a perverse relationship there, despite how, um, uh, you know, how, um, what's the right word? I mean, despicable, the, the, the result of it at the end. Um, okay. And so the important thing here is that Winston holds out this hope that O'Brien is simpatico, that you know he's looking for, a, you, you might say, a fellow revolutionary, something like that. Elias, do you want to keep going? Yeah. Guys on, Professor, what's the page? Because I'm reading it from my book. Oh, so we're sometime, somewhere around 14 or 15. I found it, I found it. But professor, I have a really quick question. So how do you think O'Brien weeded um, Winston out is it because because as we're reading he's describing how everybody else looks but every and everybody else is probably like like in in rage looking at the screen but if he's looking at all of these people what are what is he doing is that how like O'Brien kind of like weeded him out from the beginning wait so when you say what is he doing who, who's which he are you referring to as in like Winston, because like he's pointing out every what everybody else is doing, but what is he doing? And but oh, my oh, oh, oh. great, I mean, great point. I mean, you realize that Winston is not emotionally committed to the hate the way the other people are. The other people are just robotically, uh, like Pavlov's dog, responding to the images, right? And he he has some uh, distance from from this ritual. He has a bit of his own will, right? And of course, that's probably what he senses in O'Brien, that uh, O'Brien's not like robotically responding to the two minutes hate. But of course, he's an inner party member. And this ritual of the two minutes hate is really for people lower on the totem pole in this society. Like, for example, um, O'Brien, you discover he gets a nicer office. He gets uh, access to like nice wine that he gives Winston. And so this is a very hierarchical society. And each class, they're really classes of people who are treated differently depending on the type of person they are and how, how the whole mechanics of the machine, the, the machine of the regime works as a whole. I mean, so he's looking around because he's not fully invested in the two minutes hate because he senses, you know, there's something off about it. So that's how O'Brien probably weeded him out. Well, in this instant, that's true, or that's what it appears to be. But once you get later into the book, you realize that O'Brien has been like his minder for a good bit of his adult life. And that this, this whole process that seems here spontaneous, in fact, is not spontaneous. Does that make sense? Yes, very interesting. Yeah. Which makes it only more darker, be, and it, may, it makes it only darker because Winston thinks he's in the process of liberating himself and gaining some not just perspective, but like a power base with this other person to, you know, separate themselves from this regime. And in fact, what he's doing is playing into the system of control. If you've seen, what is it, the third Matrix movie? Like, you know, the, the you know, the Neo character who liberates himself from the Matrix they just say, yeah, the, the one person who liberates themselves from the matrix, this is actually part of our system of control to give you a sense of hope 
and then now we're going to put you back in place. So it's all kind of an illusion, right? It's, it's really disturbing. And if you don't understand what I'm talking about with Neo uh, being like this character of liberation who turns out to be part of the system of control, you, you've got to just watch the movie. <laughs> You, you want to keep going, Eliester? Yeah. The dark haired girl behind Wisdom had begun crying out, swine, swine, swine. And suddenly she picked up a heavy news, pit, news bag di dictionary and flung it at the screen. It shrugged Goldstein's nose and bounced off. The voice continued inexorably. In a lucid moment, Wisdom found, found that he was shouting with the others and kicking his heels violently against the rug of his own chair. The horrible thing about the two minutes of hate was not was that one was obligated to act a part, but that it was impossible to avoid joining in. Within 30 seconds, any pretense was always was always unnecessary. A hideous ecstasy of fear and vin, vindictiveness. Vindic I don't know how to say it. What was that? Vindictiveness. Vindictiveness. A desire to kill, to torture, to smash faces with the sledgehammer seemed to throw seemed to flow through the whole group of people like an electric current, turning one even against one's will into a grammatic screaming lunatic. And yet the rage that one felt was an abstract, undirected emotion, which could be switched from one object to another, like the flame of a blow lamp. Thus, at one moment, Winston's hatred was not turned against Goldstein at all, on the contrary, against Big Brother. The party and the thought police. At such moments like this, my heart went out to the lonely, derided, heretic on the screen, sole guardian of truth and sanity in a world of lies. And yet the next time in saying he was with one, he was at one with the people about him. And all of that said of Goldstein seemed to him seemed to be true. In those moments, his secret loathing of Big Brother changed into adoration, and Big Brother seemed to tower up in invisible power, powerless protector and standing like a rock against the hordes of Asia and gold scene in spite of his isolation and helplessness and doubt that hung up his very existence seemed, seemed some minister enchanter capable of mere power of his voice wrecking the structure of civilization. civilization. Okay, great. So you see this interesting thing how um, Winston's uh, emotional perspective flips from feeling hatred toward uh, Emmanuel Goldstein toward actually feeling hatred toward uh, Big Brother and the party and the thought police. And you notice when he feels hatred toward Big Brother, he feels psychologically distant from everybody around him. He feels like on an island. And then the moment that he starts feeling hatred for Goldstein again, he feels like he's in kind of sync. There's this kind of um, group, I don't know if you wanna call it hypnosis, but they're all kind of uh, enchanted into the same, uh, you know, like what happens when you go to a rock concert and everybody's like drinking or doing drugs and the music is kind of infusing the whole crowd and the crowd is not like a bunch of individuals anymore. It's like a kind of a collective organism, right? So, um, I mean, uh, Orwell has this great uh, ability to describe just this separation that uh, Winston is feeling um, because it because he has this different cognitive point of view. Um, where do I want to go here? Ah, so let's just go forward to Oh, this is this is annoying because the page numbers don't line up here with this silly Kindle version. Oh. Now, how do I close this thing? There we go. Okay, why don't we pick up right here? So now what the narrator is gonna talk about is um, the, the, the relationship with history. 
and the way history is manipulated um, uh, for the for the benefit of of control. Um, Eliester, do you think you can keep going? Yeah, I can keep going. Okay, since about that time, war had been literally continuous. Since about that time, war had been literally continuous, strict, though strictly speaking, it had not been always the same war. For several months during his childhood, there had been confusing, confused street fighting in London itself, some of which he remembered vividly. But to trace out of the history of the whole period, to say who was fighting whom at any given moment would have been utterly impossible since no written record and no spoken word ever made ever made mention of any other alignment than the existing one. At this moment, for example, in, in 1984, Oceana was at... At, was at war with Eurasia and in alliance with East Asia. In, in no public or private utterance was it ever admitted that the three powers had, had at any time had been grouped along different lines. Actually, as we so well knew, it was only four years since Oceania had been at war with, with East Asia and in alliance with Eurasia. But okay. that was- So this is the big thing about Winston, right? To, to identify um, change, to identify change, which he identifies the change in who they claim they're, they're allied with and who, who they're fighting in the war. To identify change, you need to be able to compare the previous state with the current state and to juxtapose them and to realize they're different, right? And the whole strategy of their history and the, the way they narrate it, the way they present it, the way they eliminate evidence of the past is you're never able to compare this to this and see that they're different or the same. And so Winston is able to keep a lot of stuff in his head and he's able to simply remember what it was in the past and compare it with the current state. But it, I mean, like the standard condition of humanity is like out of sight, out of mind. And I mean, I, I see the media today, like they say something yesterday and then they come on today and say something that contradicts it and they act like they're not contradicting themselves. And they expect that we just, uh, we just accept like what, what they're saying, despite the fact that they're contradicting themselves, which is a serious problem. Um, you know, I mean, just one many, of many examples, they said for, but not quite four years. It was more like three years that, that Donald Trump was a traitor with the Russians and he had colluded with the Russians and basically committed something like treason. He had stolen the 2016 election and all this stuff. And for like three years, they just hammered it every day, every day, every day, every day. And then the narrative just stopped. And then when Trump was finally impeached twice, I mean, you'd think at least one of the impeachments could be about Russia because of course he was a Russian traitor and he's like, he's like Vladimir Putin's puppet and all this stuff. And neither of the impeachments had anything to do with Russia whatsoever. So, you know, what was the evidence that they were ever talking about? And the, the, I mean, the funny thing was they talked about it for so long and then they just dropped it like it didn't like they had never said it and if they're if they really believed what they said why would you ever drop something like that i mean if you accuse someone of being a traitor and they're like the president of the united states and they've committed treason they're like benedict arnold like that's not something you just stop talking about like that's something you keep talking about until it gets resolved and i mean they when they stop talking about it like they just accept, they just expected people to like move on to the next thing. And, and they certainly moved on to the next thing. But um, the ability of us to have very short memories, right, is a serious problem when it comes to propaganda because they, ex they just expect that you're going to forget what they said yesterday. And it's actually really important that you remember. And Winston's this unusual character who makes the mental note in his mind and realizes there's a difference here. I mean, my goodness, they're in a war, right? Are they really in a war? Are they actually at war with East Asia or Eurasia? No. 
how do you know that they're not at a war? Not at war, I should say. I'm just guessing because um, it's, they talk about it very like often. It's like they're always winning something or like another time they'll say like another fact about the war and it's just like, pick one. Did you win or not? So I'm like, something's going on here that's a little fishy. Well, clearly they're not getting the whole truth about it. There's no doubt about that. Let's put it this way. Do we have any conclusive evidence that there is not a war? I don't think there was a war. I mean. Because I don't remember. So people say there's no evidence. But then, uh, I mean, but we, then there we, were. We know that Winston doesn't go off and fight it, but that's because he's in a position in society where he's not going to be a soldier. He's because he's kind of like a higher level uh, person. Uh, Weren't he throwing bombs uh, from a, uh, out of a, a airplane or something? I remember a woman cuddling a kid trying to protect him from something. Yeah, I mean there are there are things happening. I let let's just say I mean we don't know the real facts here completely. And, and obviously Winston is aware that they've changed their story. And in changing their story, uh, all the stories can't be true. Let's put it that way, right? It's just not, not possible. But, but we don't, and of course, what, what do they get on their telescreen? They get constant war propaganda, right? It's kind of like an echo of World War II. Um, so, What's the function, assuming the war is not completely real, what's the function of, of constantly propagandizing the people that they're at war? Okay, good. So Jonathan says it gives them something to direct their hate. That's obviously a really crucial thing. It directs it at the enemy and away from Big Brother and the, the reality of the regime and, and so on. It also just not just directs hate, but continues to cultivate hate. And think of all the tenuous emotions that are created by um, just the thought of being at war, regardless of whether you see much of it or not. Um, so, so I was just re watching something today Herm, Hermann Goring, who was one, he was maybe like number three in the Nazi regime under Hitler. And he said, if you ever want to get the people to do what you want them to do, um, you, you tell them that there's a, they're at war, they're in a crisis, this is the enemy, you need to mobilize them, you need to get them to do, you scare the bejesus out of them, you use fear, you say, if, if, if you don't, you know, win, win the war, your, your whole life is, you know, you know, our way of life is going to be destroyed and whatnot. So um, war has um, all these psychological dimensions, even for people who are not fighting in it, that um, uh, makes them more malleable to be controlled and to be shaped. I mean, I remember people on the, the left and some people on the right too, when, well, I guess you guys were, would have been young, but uh, in the years following 9-11, uh, George Bush had this whole like terror alert system that came into existence. Like now we have like counting COVID deaths. It's like always there on the side of the screen. And so then they had the terror alert system and it went from like, you know, yellow to orange to green to red or whatever, you know, like a stoplight and red was the worst one and orange was second bad. And so if they ever, pe people started saying that the terror alert was not based on real evidence of an actual threat, but it was just designed to freak people out, right? And to, to keep them uh, control, got it, Jim. And so um, societies have long understood how you can use war to actually shape domestic, right? We think of war as like a form of foreign policy. You're dealing with other nations, but it also allows you to control your own nation uh, actually, there's a lot of discussion around that during World War II because our whole society was mobilized for war and uh, the kind of structure of our government um, was altered 
and our our social dynamic was altered because of that military effort it puts people in the mindset of necessity if we don't win the war we're going to we're going to be killed or or we're going to lose our way of life so we're willing to do things we're willing well for example we're willing to give up freedoms that we wouldn't otherwise be willing to give up because we think that there's an existential threat and it's also just a kind of psychological trauma right the, the of of constant conflict constant violence We've been in Afghanistan for 20 years. It's unbelievable. And for the first, well, let's say 15, 14 of those years, I mean, that war was a nightly news type story for 15 years, right? That, that has an impact on people. Absolutely. You, you want to keep going, Eliester? Yeah, that sounds good. The finding thing he reflected for 10,000 for the 10,000th time as he forced his shoulder painfully backward with hands on, on hips. They were raiding their bodies from the waist and exercise that was supposed to be good for the back muscles. The frightening thing was that it might all be true. If the party could if the party could thrust its hand into the past and say of, and say of this or that event and never happened, that surely it was more terrifying than the mere torture torture and death. Okay. If the party could thrust its hand into the past and say of this or that event, it never happened. That surely was more terrifying than mere torture and death. Why? I'm not sure everybody believes that in this Zoom meeting right now. Why does Winston think that? Maybe why should we think that too? That if the party can change past events and say they never happened, that that's even more terrifying than torture and death. I mean, you're changing information. Well, on this most superficial level, you're changing information, but you're doing much more than that, ultimately. You're deceiving the people? You're absolutely doing that. Why, why is that worse than, why is that more terrifying than death? What do they really control? I mean, when you torture and kill someone, you're controlling someone's body in a certain way, right? When you're changing the past, what are you in control of? Their mind and their thoughts. Yeah, and you might even, he says it on the next, you know, a little later on, they're in control of reality. Uh, reality in this world is not simply what is given by nature, right? Reality is what the party makes it. Truth is what the party makes it. And I think you start to realize here the extent to which, for the most part, although there's some important exceptions, human nature is really tethered to living in light of the truth and what actually happens, right? I mean, we have a certain need for the truth and it's not simply some kind of intellectual exercise. Um, we feel content to live in accord with what actually is rather than an illusion, right? Because it's what we've experienced. And it ultimately, I think it ties in with our own personal identity. To have uh, reality controlled starts to undermine the integrity of who we think we actually are in a way where we can't clarify who we are. And that seems to be tremendously unsettling. And that, that's part of Winston's quest. Part of his quest is to understand the regime, but part of his, and get the truth about it. And part of his quest is to understand himself because he's aware of having kind of blank spots in his um, uh, kind of in his memory banks. Because if, I mean, uh, <laughs> he's enough aware to know that he doesn't know fully who he is without having specific knowledge of all the things that have been withheld from him. It's a rather unnerving position to, to be in. 
You want to keep going, Eliester? Yeah. The party said that Oceana had never been in alliance with Eurasia. He, Winston Smith, knew that Oceana had been in alliance with Eurasia as short as a short a time as four years ago. But, but where did that knowledge exist? Only in his own consciousness, which in any case as soon as as soon be annihilated. And if all others accepted the lie in which the party imposed, if all records told the same tale, then the lie passed into the history and became truth. Who controls the past ran the party slogan, controls the future, who controls the present controls the past. And yet the past, though of his nature alterable, never had been altered. Whatever was truth now was true from the everlasting to everlasting. It was quite simple. All of that was needed was an unsending series of victories over your own memory. Reality control, they call it. In Newsback, double think. Stand easy, bark the instructors. A little more genially. Winston sank his arms into his sides and slowly refilled his lungs with air. His mind slid away into the lab, the labyrinthine world of double thing, labyrinthine world of double thing, to know and not to know, to be conscious of complete truthfulness while telling carefully constructed lies, to hold simultaneously two opinions which canceled out, knowing them to be contradictory, contradictory, and believe in both of them, to use logic against logic, to re repudiate morality while laying claim to it to believe that democracy was impossible and that the party was the guardian of democracy to forget whatever was necessary to forget then to draw it back into memory again at the moment when it was needed and then promptly forget it again and above all to apply the same process to the process itself that was the ultimate sub sub subtle subtle i don't know how to say that subtlety subtlety yep. consciously to induce unconsciousness and then once again to become unconscious of the act hypo hypotenuse you had just performed even oh great all right so let's let's just pause for a second double think so there, there are two main functions of newspeak one is to restrict what you can think think by restricting the access to the word access to words that you have available, right? And what you're restricted to thinking is confined, you know, basically to what the party deems acceptable and it's the party ideology that's they, you know, Ingsoc, English socialism. And then the other aspect of Newspeak is that it's involved in doublethink where um, you, you can hold two contradictory thoughts at the same time and they're both true. That's double thing. And of course, that defies our basic notions of logic and the principle of non contradiction. You know, Aristotle says that logic is based on the law, what he calls the law of the excluded middle. Uh, a light switch can't be both on and off simultaneously. It can be on at time A and off at time B, but it can't be on and off at time A, obviously. So it's the, it's the law of excluded middle is just the law of non-contradiction. And so why is double think so important? Um, I think one reason, it just allows them to change the meaning of things and words and realities whenever they need to. Um, and so, I mean, what's an example of, dub, of double think here? He says, and yet the past, though its nature is uh, alterable, never had been altered, right? So he says on one hand, the past is alterable, but it never had been altered. Uh, and whatever was true now was true from everlast everlasting to everlasting, right? So the past is either uh, alterable and it's been changed or it's unalterable and has always been the same. But of course, what does what is, what is, um, the narrator say here? Uh, he says, it's both unalterable and alterable. It's both unchangeable, but it also has been changed. And so they on, on the surface, they totally contradict one another. 
But if you think about it, it actually makes sense because within the realm of this regime, the past is treated as alterable. And the past here refers simply to what we tell you about the past, right? It's like, what is history? Do you understand history as the actual series of events that happened? Or do you understand history as the stories we tell about what happened? Because once we're in the present, which we're always in the present, uh, the past is always a story we tell about the past. And this raises questions about its relationship to what actually happened. So on one hand, the, the past is alterable because it's based on um, artifacts and it's based on stories that are changeable and they change them to suit their needs. On the other hand, there is something that really happened that we call the past that no matter how much you rewrite the history books, you can't change. So this double think principle seems to be, uh, it creates this kind of cognitive dissonance, right? And the, the famous lines are war is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. And it simply redefines words, right? Like if, if slavery is actually a condition of freedom, well then gee, slavery is good and I want slavery right? But it also just, it, it's confusing. It, it creates this uh, reality of uncertainty because there's no clarity about what is what. And it, and it seems to be that uh, apart from just desiring to live in accord with the truth of what the world actually is, we also, um, you know, we function on the principle of non-contradiction. Uh, obviously, everybody's irrational at times, but we, we expect that, um, things have a, a, a intelligibility on a most basic level. And this whole world they create through doublethink is so unintelligible as to, to be almost like psychologically debilitating for the people who are living in it. Kind of just compels you to capitulate, right? So later on, O'Brien, when he's re-educating um, Winston, you know, he, he holds up four fingers and he says, how many fingers is I, am I holding up? And uh, Winston says, well, it's obviously four. And he tells Winston, sorry, you're wrong. I'm holding up five fingers. <laughs> and then to make even a more perverse, he says, how many fingers am I holding up now? And Winston goes five. And he goes, no, I don't believe you. You're lying. So he shocks him again, right? E even though he's given him the right answer, the, the quote unquote right answer, right? So it's, it's very perverse. Um, you know what we should do is go forward. Oh, so we should talk a little bit more about Newspeak here. Um, yeah. That's not the one. Ellie Esther, how are you doing? Can you keep reading? Yeah, I can keep reading. All right, you just tell me if it's it's too much. Okay, I'll let you know. A lovely job. Thank you. And so that's that's why I'm so committed to you keep going. <laughs> All right, you want me to start now? Yeah. So here he's going to talk about the the dictionary of Newspeak and and give us some flavor about what what this is all about. Okay. The 11th edition is a definition is a definitive edition. He said, we're getting the language into its final shape. The shape is going to have when nobody speaks anything else. When we fin when we finish with it, people like you will have to learn it all over again. You think I dare say that our chief job is inventing new words, but not a bit of it. We're destroying words, scores of them, hundreds of them every day. We're cutting the language down to the bone. The 11th edition won't contain a single word that will become absolute, absolute before the year of 2050. He, a bit hungrily, into his bread and swallowed a couple of mouthfuls, then continued speaking with a sort of pendant passion. His thin, dark face had then become animated. His eyes had lost their mocking expression and grown almost dreamy. It's a beautiful thing, the destruction of words. Of course, the great wastage 
in its verbs and adjectives, but there are hundreds of nouns that, that can get rid of as well. It isn't only the synonyms, it's also the antonyms. After all, what justification is there for a word, which is simply the opposite of some other word? A word contains its opposite in itself. Take good, for example. If you have a word like good, what need is there for a word like bad? On good, will it do just as well better? Because it's an exact opposite, which is the other is not. Or again. Oh, okay, great, great. So here the, he's speaking to another character um, who, who works in the ministry of truth with him. So notice they, they alter history, they edit it, and here they're doing the same thing with the language. And he says, you'd think you'd invent more language, you'd invent new language, but our goal is to e eliminate as many words as possible, right? And so a couple things here. Um, normally, language, because of its combinatory powers, is generative. And by generative, I just mean language is constantly changing and it's constant through our communication, through speech, it's constantly generating new expressions, new uses, new usages of words, new words. So language typically is a con in a constant state of expansion, right? Here they want to have this radical contraction. He says, good and bad. Why do you, first of all, why do you need synonyms? Why do you need four words for one concept, right? A good and bad, why do I need antonyms? A good contains the opposite within it. So instead of saying bad or evil or what have you, we're just gonna say ungood, right? And it sounds really awkward. What's the logic behind the, the, the elimination of language here? I mean, we have this under threat in our own society. All the classics are have something wrong with them. Uh, somebody's a bigot, a racist, a colonialist. Uh, they look at the world in the wrong way. They represent the wrong people. Um, almost all great works of classical literature that you could think of have come under attack in the last 50 years, right? Um, and they want to get rid of them and they want to teach other stuff like graphic novels and stuff like that. What's the function of limiting the language? I mean, other than for them to have their own language. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the, the, the language control has a purpose, right? It's not just so they can have their own language, like we're from Oceania and this is the language we speak. That it's not like an aesthetic thing. Well, I mean, it would also be like for the government to continue to control one other thing. Okay. Level? Yes. So, I mean, who are they ultimate? What What are they ultimately controlling by controlling the language? The citizens, like the people. How? By eliminating like like freedom of like not freedom of speech but like they're like they're no, no, no. Abs absolutely freedom of speech is involved here and like freedom right? because they're taking away kind of like their right to speak in a way because they wouldn't really be speaking as they normally and, and, as and not normal. just the right to speak but the right to what to communicate i don't disagree but even more basic not just the right to speak but the right to do what have freedom of thought and think yeah. for yourself and you, I mean, it's not even a matter of being a right uh, in the sense that if you don't have the language with all the various and variegated meanings, the diverse meanings, you can't think the thoughts, right? I mean, this is really crucial. If you don't have the breadth of vocabulary and grammar and, com uh, and all the richness of the language, you can't think all these different nuanced thoughts. And if you can't think those thoughts, you cannot perceive those realities in the world. So by taking away the language, you're taking away the thought. And by taking away the thought, you're taking away the ability of human beings to see those things in the world, right? I don't know, just think, uh, you know, uh, 
you had two words to describe everything, black and white. All the diversity of the world would be forced into, oh, it's either black or white, or it's same thing, either it's good or bad, right? Uh, eliminating a whole swath of uh, just, you know, nuance about what the world and the nuance of our language allows to have allows us to have greater fidelity to what we're actually experiencing right so it's part of this reality control that he's been talking about so we talked about change of history but now we're getting more more fundamental because language is the medium of history right so it's e even more more powerful um and of course, one of the primary things that they, I mean, this is a course on frenemies, friendship and human relationships. One of the key th concepts that they are trying to eliminate is the concept of love in any meaningful sense of the word, right? They know hate, they don't know love. All right, you wanna keep going, Ellie Esther? Yeah, I can keep going. It would be the next page. The string of vague uses words like excellent and splendid and all of the rest of them plus good covers the meaning or double plus good if you want something stronger still. Of course, we use those forms already, but in the final version of Newspeak, there'll be nothing else. In the end, the whole notion of goodness and badness will be covered by only six words in reality, only one word. Don't you see the beauty of that, Winston? It was BB's idea originally. Of course, he added... He added as an afterthought, a sort of. Let, let me ask you, he says you don't need good and bad anymore. You just need good and ungood. Well, is, is bad just an opposite for good? So notice he says you don't need words like excellent or splendid, which would be like very good. You just need plus good. It's like plus good. It's, it's kind of like saying very good. First of all, look at how they speak. They speak in like acronyms in these like abbreviated. Uh, so I think what, one of the issues here is that all these synonyms and these, so first of all, an antonym is not merely simply opposite the other word. It also has other shades of meaning that capture shades of experience. Um, when we talk about excellent or splendid or just good or okay, we're not simply talking about like an high, a hierarchy of how good something was. Each word uh, has its own shades of meaning independent of fitting into that hierarchy of whether something was good, very good or super good, right? Um, if you're not using the word good, but you're using another word, what you're doing is you're saying something else, right? And they're trying to eliminate that from, from people's power of expression. All right, you want to keep going? Yeah. A sort of vapid eagerness fitted across Winston's face, the mention of Big Brother. Nevertheless, Sam immediately detected a certain lack of enthusiasm. You haven't a real appreciation of newspaper, Winston, he almost said sadly. Even when you write it, you're still thinking of old speak. I've read, I've read some of those pieces that you write in the Times occasionally. They're good enough, but they're translations. In your heart, you'd prefer to stick to old speak with all vagueness and useless shades of meaning. You don't grasp, grasp the beauty of the destruction of words. Do you know that Newspeak is the only language in the world whose vocabulary gets smaller every year? So, so look what he says. He says, you know, all those useless shades of meaning, you're attached to old speak. What what is old speak specifically? English. Yeah, it's it's called the ordinary English language, as it's been informed by its history, you know, for a thousand, you know, roughly a thousand years. Are those shades of meaning useless? mean of new speak of or english no so so his friend you know such as it is because you know obviously they have very different points of view his friend said oh winston you're you, you know you still haven't embraced new speak in the way you should 
I, I can tell that the way you write is still influenced by old speak. And you've got all these, you have, you hold on to all these useless shades of meaning, right? That it, That is possible in old speak, you've got all these shades of meaning um, because you've got the vocabulary to express all those nuances of meaning. Are all those nuances and shades of meaning useless? <laughs> Jim says no, why not? I agree. I'm teaching a literature course. <laughs> But there's a much deeper reason other than just teaching a class. Why why are these why are these shades of meaning vital to our existence? I'm gonna argue they're vital to our existence, vital to our humanity. And shapes our identity. Yes, yeah, shapes our identity and in part by shaping our perceptions of the world. The 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 more nuance of meaning you have at your disposal, the more concepts you have the more you can uh, employ those concepts in differentiating your experience and making more subtle distinctions in your own experience that you can't make with new speak because everything's the same, right? Everything gets treated in this kind of increasingly uniform way as the language gets whittled down and you start losing experience uh, from life. I mean, there is an aesthetic dimension to this that uh, there's a whole uh, domain of experience that's going to be severed from the people who speak newspeak. And, it, and obviously, if, if, if that experience is severed from them, it means it's not going to be part of them and their own identity is going to be kind of siphoned down to this rather simplistic um, cog in the machine of this society. Yeah, the, the more you can articulate, uh, Omar, right. And so the key thing about articulation is that it's not just speaking fancy or in a sophisticated way. It's, it's, it's distinguishing your experiences with greater fidelity and doing them more justice. Like what is the actual nature of my life? What is, who, who am I, right? The, the, the more language you have at your disposal, the, the more precise and the, with, and the greater fidelity you can have in actually articulating that, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, what's being described here is profoundly disturbing when you think about it. You wanna keep going, Aliester? Yeah. Winston didn't know that, of course, he smiled symp symp sympathetically. He hoped not trusting himself to speak Sam bit off another fragment of a dark colored bread, chewed it briefly and went on. Don't you see what the whole aim of Newspeak is to narrow the range of thought? In the end, we shall make thought crime literally impossible because there will be no words in which to express it. Every concept that could ever be needed will be expressed exactly by one word with its meaning rigidly defined in all of the subsidiary meanings rubbed out and forgotten already in the 11th edition, we're not far from that point, but the process will still be continuing along after you and I are done. Every year, fewer and fewer words and the range of consciousness always gets smaller, a little smaller. Even now, of course, there's no reason to excuse for committing thought crime. It's merely a question of self-discipline, reality control, but in, but in the end, there won't be needing any, there won't be any need even for that. The revolution will be complete even when the language is perfect. Newspeak is in sock and in sock is newspeak. When added with a sort of mystical satisfaction. Has it ever occurred to you, Winston, that by the year 2050 and the very latest, not a single human being will be alive who could understand such conversation as we are having now? Except and, and you know what? They won't be they won't be able to understand the world they're living in. I mean. What, what does in, ingsoc mean? So part of what Newspeak does, it doesn't just eliminate words, but it, it, it like mashes them up into these um, uh, kind of um, contractions, kind of a version of a contraction. What is in ingsoc? That's 
As somebody said it last class, I thought. Nobody remembers what Ingsoc is? It, sound, it, sound, it sounds like a, it sounds like a name for a corporation or something, right? Jim says the ruling party, not quite, but it's related to it. See, you guys don't even, this is important and this proves the point. You don't even know what's really being stated here because you don't know what in INGSOC stands for. And, and by understanding what the it stands for, you understand truly what its meaning is about. INGSOC is a contraction for English socialism, right? Um, yeah, socialism, but I English socialism. First of all, you know, what is England without the English language? <laughs> and, I, and I'm not just being cute here, the play on words. Um, I mean, England is a product of its language. I mean, all nations, one of the central things that shapes their identity is their particular language and its history. And this is all about eliminating the history, right? So think about this uh, in relationship to our society and some of the historical things that they're trying to cancel or destroy uh, and prevent people from having a censor, prevent people from having access to. And of course, socialism, they're living in they're living in, you know, a communist regime. Oh, what, what's the difference between socialism and communism? Uh, question for another time. But socialism does start to get at uh, the, the fundamental type of political regime they live in. But if they don't have that word uh, and its meaning, they can't even begin to conceive of the type of regime they're living in and how it's different from, say, other types of regimes, right? which is to say you're unable to judge its worth or its value. And of course you're told it's wonderful, right? Um, so think about this. Throughout this course, we've talked about how language as a medium of communication is almost like the essence, the essence of human relationships because it's the dominant thing we do and it's the most distinctly human thing we do. And uh, language in its form of just talking back and forth, but also in what it communicates, this tremendous breadth of ideas that are important and powerful and dear to us. Um, it, it binds people together in, in tremendous intimacy, right? Uh, we just talked about, you know, Aristotle's polis is bound together by discussion about the nature of happiness and that nature being manifest in common notions of good and bad, just and unjust, in law. Um, it talked about the imagined order, uh, you know, with um, in sapiens in which people are bound together as community through uh, uh, the creative function of language and the um, solidarity that that creates. And then we look at the symposium and that the higher forms of love are really about uh, interaction in speech with one another. And um, a lot of that, the intimacy and solidarity that's created through talking together, right? Talking together is about having uh, language at our disposal to bring us together in a kind of community. And here, uh, our, our relationships are going to be stripped of all their richness by eliminating the, the, la the language down to the most bare fundamentals. It's, it's terrifying. Um, these people in 2050, they won't know what it's like to have a real human relationship with another human being because of what they're doing to the language here. So imagine that. You wanna keep going, Eliester? Yeah. Except began Winston doubtfully and then stopped. It had been on the tip of his tongue to say, except Poles, but he checked himself, not feeling fully certain that this remark was not only in some way unorthodox. Syme, however, had undivined, undivined what he was about to say. The Poles are not human beings, he said carelessly. By 2050 earlier, probably, all real knowledge of all speak will have disappeared. The whole literature of the past will have been destroyed. Chaucer and Shakespeare. 
Milton and Brian still exist only in newspeak versions and not merely changed into something different, but actually changed into something contradictory of what they used to be. Even the literature of the party will change. Even the slogans will change. How could you have a slogan like freedom is slavery when the concept of, of freedom has been abolished? The whole climate of thought will be different. In fact, there will be no thought as we understand it now. Unorthodoxy means not thinking, not needing to think. Unorthodoxy is unconsciousness. Now, just, of, think, just think about what this society does. It enslaves you and then takes away your concept of freedom so that slavery is perceived as enjoyable. And you don't have any alternative to conceive of, right? There is, there is no psychological conceiving of liberation from slavery because there's no concept of it. So there's just slavery, right? Uh, question, Chaucer, Shakespeare, Milton, Byron, who are these people in a nutshell? Yes, they're poets. Can we be, can we get a little more specific? I mean, they write about literature. Well, so, they don't write about, I mean, they write literature. Or yeah, write yeah. A drama, what, what have you. A anything particular about these specific poets and why they're being mentioned and mentioned in this order? First of all, what nationality are they all? They write in the English language. Yes, they're all English poets. They're all presented in historical order from Chaucer, the earliest, to Byron in the 19th century, right? Shakespeare is um, the late 16th, early 17th century. Milton is in the middle of the 17th century, and then Byron is in the 19th century. And not only are they English poets, but they're seen as like the bearers of the English language and having shaped the English language in a kind of decisive way, in the same way that Dante in, um, in Italy was understood as literally kind of shaping the Italian language. Um, I mean, there's an interesting story about Dante and the Italian that he wrote in that actually didn't exist at the time because he kind of combined multiple dialects and created a kind of synthesis of different dialects that was unusual. Um, but the point is, the, this is like the canon of English literature and the bearers of the English la language and the shapers of it they're they're like the heart of it, and um, they're they're basically going to be, um, uh, you know, um, what what's the what's the best expression? They're they're going to be purified in into to newspeak, and uh, making Milton into newspeak or making Byron into newspeak means that it's not Milton anymore, means that it's not really Byron anymore because Milton and Byron are defined by their language. And if you change their language, they're not really who they are anymore in their, in their, true, in their true meaning. And there's a kind of classic motif coming out of the ancient world that like uh, the poets are the bearers of a nation's language. They speak the lang language. Um, Today, if you think about writers combined with musicians and pop culture, that might be true, true for us. Um, so a, a lot of our sayings still filter down from like pop music expressions come into the vernacular through through pop culture, pop, pop music. Same same idea here. Um, where are we? Oh, oh, so one last thing before we move on here. Where, where is it? Um, he says that eventually, Newspeak, when it's completed, 
will make thought crime literally impossible because there will be no words in which to express it. What does he mean by that? People won't even have their own thoughts anymore. Yeah, so if you take the thought, the words away from them and you prevent them from using them, they won't be able to have the thoughts. And so, I mean, what's the idea here that any concept that is threatening to the regime that's considered a thought crime will simply, the word will be eliminated from the language, like freedom, eliminated from the language and you won't be able to think it. And because you won't be able to think it, you can't be guilty of a thought crime. It's kind of the, the ultimate control system where you take away even the possibility of deviating from uh, you know, the, the, the status quo or, or what's expected. Um, so let's, let's go forward and we won't go too much longer here, but we need to touch on it. Um, in the book, it's page 65 and we start talking about the, relate, the role of sex and how the party views sex in this society. Aim of the party. So this is fascinating. So we, we've gotten a pretty clear picture now about the role of language. But here we, we come back to this theme. We've talked about it with hate and the way they cultivate hate. But this issue of how they uh, try to destroy or highly regulate any form of human intimacy, right? Uh, as a way of preventing human beings from forming loyalties to one another that would be threatening to the regime. So remember we saw in Pausanias's speech, the Persians don't allow philosophy and sport and uh, some other things because they think it foments interpersonal relationships that are too strong and when they're too strong, people come together and become strong and be they're a threat to the regime. Uh, and so when you divide them, they are weak. And we saw that uh, Zeus in, uh, in Aristophanes speech, uh, the human beings become a threat to his power. They, they wanna become like gods um, because they're whole. And so what does he do? And when they're whole, they're strong. So what does he do? He cuts them in half and divides them so they're weak. And he says, if you guys act up again, I'll even cut you again. And this whole theme of divide and conquer, divide and make weak, and then you're not a, you're no longer a threat. How, how you doing, Elias? Do you think you can go a little bit longer? Yeah, I can go a little bit longer. Okay. Settings. So where the yellow is? You're the aim of the party. Okay. The aim of the party was not merely to prevent men and women from forming loyalties, which it might not be able to control. It's real. Undeclared purpose was to remove all pleasure from the sexual act, not love so much as erotic was the enemy, aside marriage as well as outside it. All marriages between party members had to be approved by a committee appointed for the purpose, and though the principle was never cl clearly stated, permission has always was always refused if the couple concerned gave the impression of being physically attracted to one another. The recognition, the recognition purpose of marriage was to beget children for all the service of the party. Sexual in intercourse was to be looked on as slightly disgusting minor operation, like having an enema. This again was never put into plain words, but in an indirect way, it was rubbed into every party member from childhood onwards. There was even organizations such as the Junior Anti-Sex League, which advocated complete celibacy for both sexes. All children were to be begotten by artificial insemination. Artisan, it was called the Newsbag, and brought into public institutions. This, Winston was aware, was not meant altogether seriously, but somehow it fitted into the general ideology of the party. The party was trying to kill the sex instinct where it would not or it could not be killed. Then to distort it and dirty it. He could not know why this was so, but it seemed natural that it should be so and so far as. Okay, so let's stop. So their, one of their main goals is to take away pleasure from the sexual act. And I think it's ironic when we think about our own society because 
it constantly highlights the pleasure of sex and downplays the fact that babies are produced. So there's something ironically kind of puritanical about this world that's that's almost inverted from our own. And I always think that, you know, if I was going to be a evil genius and craft a totalitarian society, the first thing I would do is to pr promote everything that our society promotes in order to destroy, because they still want to destroy the family in this world. Communism wants to destroy the family. Uh, BLM, Black Lives Matter, they're a communist organization. Uh, until recently, they had posted on their website, their official website, that they wanted to undermine the nuclear family because it was a product of, um, I don't know, white capitalism or something like that, which of course is absurd because the family is something, you know, basically universal throughout history across all cultures. But that's another story. But I mean, we see the divide and conquer strategy. And uh, you think if it was done today, that you would promote like lascivious sexual relations where it was all sex and no genuine emotional intimacy and no um, commitment or duty or obligation to the other person. And that you would um, you know, minimize the whole role of child production as a consequence of sex. And sex would just be like uh, pleasure seeking something like that, which is almost exactly what we have in our society today, right? That, that you know, I, I think to, to a great extent leads to a kind of degradation of relationships between human be beings because it trivializes things into just pleasure seeking and, and neglects all the, a lot of the serious stuff that comes with it. Um, why, why do they want to destroy pleasure here as part of, uh, of of the sexual act. Pleasure brings people together. Yeah, so connection. Absolutely. So in our society, pleasure is kind of like for it's it's like what we talked about with Aristotle and the friendship by was based on pleasure. It's like um uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, friends with benefits. And people take the pleasure, but don't take the intimacy. But here, Orwell is focusing on it in a, in a different way, where the pleasure is something positive, And it's the positivity of the experience had with another human being that then creates the intimacy and the connection. And they don't want that connection to happen because as I mean, this, this states the divide and conquer strategy explicitly. The aim of the party was not merely to prevent women, women from forming loyalties, which might, which it might not be able to control, right? So that's divide and conquer. So very good. Any other thoughts about why they want to get rid of pleasure? What, what about this thought of like children being begotten through artificial insemination, like outside as opposed to actual sex? So there they just eliminate sex altogether. Sex is a threat to this regime because it, it's, gonna, it's human intimacy, right? I mean, I, I just saw an ad for a product that doesn't actually completely exist, but the idea of it exists in which it was an artificial womb that looked like a little pod almost like the pods in the movie, The Matrix, where instead of the fetus developing inside the mother's womb, it would be in this like space age looking pod with a window on it. And it would allow the woman to go off and do her nine to five job and be liberated from that, you know, that baby bump and the bun in the oven and all that stuff. And they would just go on with their lives like they weren't having a child and it even had little cart, you want to feed the child? Well, you, you know, you don't have the connection of the body or the umbilical cord or breastfeeding. There's just a little cartridge you can buy, you know, like the Keurig cartridges that go in the coffee coffee maker machines. I mean, it was, the, it was like the most repulsive, um, uh, disconnected um, thing I'd, I'd ever seen. 
And it seemed like the strategy was to distance uh, you know, mothers from the connection that they naturally have with their child because it's inside of them and part of them. Um, and if you ever read the other dystopian novel, Brave New World, they, they produce test tube babies precisely so that the mothers and also, you know, the fathers too, don't develop the same type of emotional connection with them that they otherwise would. Exciting stuff. Where are we at the bottom of the page? Yeah, we were at the bottom. So, and so far as? The women were concerned, the party's efforts were largely successful. He thought again of Catherine. It must be nine, 10, nearly 11 years since they had parted. It was curious how seldom he thought of her. For days at a time, he was capable of forgetting that he had ever been married. They had only been together for about 15 months. The party did not permit divorce, but it rather encouraged separation in cases, in cases where there were no children. Catherine was a tall, fair-haired girl, very straight with splendid movements. She had a bold, qualling qual face, a face that one might have called noble until one discovered that it was nearly as impossible nothing behind him. Very early in their married life, he had decided, though perhaps it was only that he knew her more intimate. He only knew, knew most people that she had, without exception, the most stupid, vulgar, empty-minded that he had ever encountered. She had not a thought in her head that was not a slogan. There were not, there was, there was no imbecile, absolutely none. She was not capable of swallowing in the party handed, handed out to her. The human soundtrack, he nicknamed her in his own head, in his own mind. Yeah, he could have endured living with her if it, had, if it had not been just for one thing, sex. As soon as he touched her, she seemed to wince and stiffen. To embrace her was like embracing a jointed wooden image. She, and that was strange was that even when she was cla clasping him against her, he had a feeling that she was simultaneous, simultaneously pushing him away with all of her strength. The, the raggedy of her muscles managed to convey that impression. She would lie there with her eyes shut, neither resisting nor cooperating, but submitting. She was extraordinarily embarrassing and after a while, horrible. But even then, he could have, been, he could have borne living with her if it had not been agreed that they should remain celibate. But curiously enough, it was Catherine who refused this. They must, they must she said, produce a child if they could. So they, so the performance continued to happen. What, what is he saying here? So uh, Catherine finds sex. It's not, it's not she finds him. I mean, he's not the most appealing guy in the world. They describe like his varicose veins and he just doesn't look healthy. She's not repulsed with him as a human being. She's repulsed at the idea of sex. Why is she so repulsed at the idea of sex? I mean, isn't that what they want? Okay, good. It's not complicated because she has so internal. I mean, you realize there's control, but not everybody is equally on board, right? There is some personal variation. They still have some freedom of thought, right? It's not completely extinguished. But she's a character who is just in completely absorbed the habituation of the regime. And they've actually made her disgusted by her own body, by the sexual act. And it seems it's important that um, she's been indoctrinated in this way and she's repulsed by it. And so, I mean, what does what Winston basically say? You know, everything would have be, been fine if we didn't have to have sex at all. I, I would have been happy with that. But despite the fact that she was wood, like a, a wooden plank uh, embracing her and that she was disgusted by sex, she was the one who actually uh, demanded that they do it. And why is that? Why did she feel so obliged to do it? So they can have a baby. Yeah, and be and why is that? Because the party told her told her this mm -hmm. is what she should do. So notice, she she is not acting on her own desires at all. She's kind of like an automaton. She's not responding to him. She's not responding to his personality. It's not about any expression of mutual warmth. Warmth. It's about carrying out a duty and a responsibility that the party has given her. Um, 
you can see she she's like she's kind of like a zombie whose mind has been inhabited you know like by the hive mind or something like that it's it's really terrifying you, you want to keep going yeah so the performance continued to happen once a week quite regularly whenever it was not possible Impo not impossible she used to even remind him of it even in the morning as something which had to be done that evening and which was not and which must not be forgotten she like, had two names for like, one like brushing your teeth or something like that yeah <laughs> so one was making a baby and the other and the other was our duty to the party yes she had actually used that phrase quite now, soon can he you imagine that uh <laughs> hey honey now you we have to do our duty to the party <laughs> This sounds so crazy. Yeah. Quite soon, he grew to have a feeling of a positive dread when the day appointed to came around, but luckily no child appeared. And in the end, she agreed to give up trying and soon afterwards, they parted. Winston sighed inaudibly. He picked up his pen again and wrote, she threw, him, she threw herself down on the bed and at once without any kind of preliminary in the most in the most coarse, horribly way you can imagine, pulled up her skirt. I saw him, I saw himself standing there in the dim, in the dim, dim light with with the smell of bugs and chief scents in his nostrils, and in his heart a feeling of defeat and resentment, which even at the moment was mixed up with the thought of Catherine's white body, frozen forever by the hypnotic power of the party. Why did it always have to be like this? Why could he not have a woman of his own instead of filthy scruffles at intervals of years? But a real love affair was in an almost unthinkable event. The women of the party were all alike. Chastity was a deeply integrated in them a party loyalty. By careful early conditioning by games and cold water, by the rubbish that was dinned into them at school and the spice and the youth league by lectures Paragate song, slogans, and martial music, the natural feeling had been driven out. His reason told him that there must be exceptions, but his heart did not believe it. They were all impregnable, and the party intended that they should be. And what he wanted more than to be loved was to break down the wall of virtue, even if even, even if it were only once in his whole life, the sexual act successfully performance was rebellion desire was thought crime even to have awakened catherine if he could have achieved it would have been like a like a seduction almost although she was his wife but the rest of the story had had to be written down he wrote i turned up the lamp when i saw her in the light oh, okay the great so what what are these italicized sections of the text let's just clarify that I turned up the light when I saw her in the, it, I turned up the lamp when I saw her in the light. <laughs> what, what are the italicized portions? So this little passage, she threw herself down on the bed with any kind of preliminary in the most coarse, horrible way you can imagine, pulled up her skirt, I dot, dot, dot. What is this? What 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 writing is this? Isn't he not supposed to have those thoughts? Yeah, his thoughts. He picked up his pen again and wrote. What is he doing here? Can you speak? Writing down his memory, his thoughts. His memory. Yes. So what 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 Orwell is doing as a kind of uh, conceit of the narrative is. He's reminding us that the story we're getting here is really coming from his recollection as it's being written down in the diary, right? So we transition from, uh, you know, Winston actually narrating the story himself to then the narrator picking up the rest of the story where, you know, where it leave, leaves off, right? So you see, um, this kind of integration between the narration and his um, his um, uh, diary writing. So, so notice something you know really crucial here: it, the the way in which they associate sex with the political implications of the regime. The sexual act performed success successfully performed was rebellion, right? That's a kind of political concept. Uh, 
uh, desire was thought crime, even to have awakened Catherine. Uh, if you had achieved it, it would have been like a seduction, uh, although she was uh, his his wife. Um, and his, his goal becomes, what does he describe? Breaking through this wall, uh, he calls it a, a wall of virtue. But I mean, just to illustrate the way in which elements from their larger society and the political structure filter down into the most intimate aspects of their lives that, that we would all call, this is my, you know, my, my space. This, this is where I am. And the world of politics and the world of the rules of society, uh, they stop at my door, right? Um, even in a society that has, um, you know, a private sphere like our own, it's still the case that all these things are seeping into the most intimate parts. And, and it's important as an adult to realize that, to be able to make judgments and decisions for your own life about what you do and don't want, right? Um, and it's not obvious the way these things kind of infiltrate into the most intimate aspects of our life. I just, I just wanna pick up one little continuation of these thoughts um, because it's also interesting. And I just had it, it's page 131 in the text. Oh, this is confusing. Three messages. Oh, this is silly. He learned. Okay, so they're gonna pick up th this theme here of relations between men and women, basically get picked up directly from the section we just read, but now it's on page 131 and he's in this relationship with Julia and he's recounting some of the conversations he has with Julia. And he's also still reflecting back on his, his life with Catherine. You can see everything he's doing is a provocation. Um, you can see everything he's doing is really a form of a crime in this world. Uh, looking back into his own past, establishing this intimacy with a person that he's not permitted to have this kind of intimacy with, enjoying himself actually seems to be a crime in and of itself. Eliester, could, could you pick up one last time from uh, right here, the highlighted part? Yeah. He okay. learned with astonishment that all workers in Pranasek, except the head of the department, were girls. The theory was that men whose sex instincts were less controllable than those of women were in greater danger of being corrupted by the filth they handled. They don't even like having married women here, she added. Girls are always supposed to be so pure. He's one who isn't. Anyway, she had, she had had her first love affair when she was 16 with a party member of 60 who later committed suicide to avoid arrest. A good job too, said Julia. Otherwise, they'd have my name out of him when he confessed. Since then, there have been various others. Life as she saw it was quite simple. You want to have a good time? They, meaning the party, wanted, to stop, wanted you to stop having it. You broke the rules as best as you could. She seemed to think that it was just as natural that they should have to rob you of your pleasures and that you should want to avoid being caught she hated the party and said said in the crudest words but made but she made no general criticism of it except when she touched upon her own life she had no interest in party doctrine okay let's just pause a second so one one interesting commentary that orwell seems to be making is that if you want to control society you have to control the the women and their sexuality I mean, that seems to be a premise of this, because of course men will do whatever the women want for the most part. Um, 
I think that generally seems to be true. And I mean, he, he has an interesting claim about, um, you know, the, the, the men being more uncontrollable than the women. That's interesting, it's debatable. Um, I think the other thing is here, this whole society sets up it very easy for everyone to commit a crime, right? So she, he talks about Julia being in love with this older party member of 60 who commits suicide after giving in to the temptation of sleeping with her. Uh, he commits suicide to avoid arrest because he, he doesn't want to go through with it. And he does the job of the society for them by, by offing himself. But it's like, uh, given their restrictions on intimacy, it's like everyone is automatically a criminal because everyone is going to, most everyone's going to have an impulse to break the rules. Like there's kind of one principle of a society. You, you, can't, you can't create a rule that everyone's going to break all the time because it just, it, you can't function that way. So you have to accept certain things about people's, people's conduct. But here by uh, denying, er we could say eros, right? This thing that's really fundamental to human beings. Um, uh, everyone kind of automatically becomes a criminal. Um, what's her deal? What's Julia's deal with um, what she's doing? What motivates her to be in this relationship with Winston? She's able to break the rules with him. Yeah, what, what's her motivation for wanting to break the rules? To experience pleasure. Yeah, so these characters are similar, but they're also different, right? They have slightly different motivations. Julia is driven by pleasure and she's a kind of a, an innocent hedonist. Like hedonist is just someone who lives by the point of view of pleasure. Remember the three lives, there's contemplation, there's uh, the politics and there's pleasure, right? So it's no mystery here about what she thinks happiness is for herself. And so since she loves pleasure and the society restricts it, she does hate the society for preventing her from doing the thing that she wants to do. Um, is she political? Is she some kind of radical who wants to like overturn the system? No, she could care less. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's the right way to put it. She could really care less about all the politics. She's not invested in it at all intellectually. She doesn't really seem to care about the truth of things either. So we see some important commonalities, but also some important differences. I mean, Winston is driven by a couple different, well, well maybe you should just ask. Um, uh, if, if she's driven by pleasure and she's politically indifferent and she's even indifferent to the truth what what are some of the core things that drive winston what motivates him on this quest of rebellion they're they're both engaged in you know uh, these profound acts of rebellion by the standards of this society um, trying to find his identity yeah, and uh, absolutely. And I think we might frame it more generally. He, he has a genuine concern for the truth and the truth motivates him. And that's a really, actually, it turns out the truth is a very intimate, practical matter for him because he wants to know more about who he is uh, and who he is depends a lot on his own past. Whereas Julia, who she is in terms of pleasure seeking, that's something that kind of can only always be found in the present. Um, and also he has a concern for understanding the truth of the regime he's in. And, he, and that makes him, I think, more politically invested. I mean, he starts getting ideas of like actually trying to liberate himself from this system. And this is exactly why he's deemed such a threat, you know, that, that he needs to be re-educated in book three by O'Brien. Mm. LAS, do you wanna go just a little more and we'll call it a night? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, he noticed that she never used newspeak words except the ones that had she, that she had passed into everyday use. She had never heard of of the brotherhood and refused to believe it in existence. Any kind of organized revolt against the party, which was bound to be a failure, 
shook her as stupid. The okay. cover thing was question. What is the brotherhood? Is that the party? Actually, no. Brotherhood is the opposite. Brotherhood are, um, I guess, the group of people who want to take down the party. Yeah, you could call it the resistance, right? And the brotherhood, it has an appropriate name because I, I, although ironically, it's like big, big brother and the brotherhood. Um, is the brotherhood real? Does it exist? Nobody knows. Yeah, nobody knows. And just like a lot of things, you don't, you never get certain knowledge about things. But there is a suggestion in book three that the Brotherhood is kind of like a fabrication of the regime to encourage those people who are inclined to be dissidents to then try to seek it out. And by seeking it out, then they can expose themselves and they can catch them. So it's kind of almost like it seems to be used as a kind of bait, although we don't know for sure. Um, so you know, one element of this society that it's considered is it understands its control is not absolute. It understands that people are going to deviate from the norm. So then they've already set up a mechanism to deal with those feisty people who, who are, get ideas and are, are free thinkers, right? And they get kind of fed into another system of control, which is they end up at the Ministry of Love. Okay. You want to keep going, Eliester? Almost done here. Yeah. The clever thing was to break the rules and stay alive all the same. He wondered vaguely how many others like her there might be in the younger generation. People who had grown up in the world of the revolution, knowing nothing else, accepting the party as something unalterable, like the sky, not rebelling against its authority, but simply evading it as a rabbit dodges a dog. They did not discuss the possibility of getting married. It was too remote to be worth thinking about. No imaginable committee would ever sanction such a marriage, even if Catherine Winston's wife could somehow have gotten, have been got rid of. It was hopeless as a daydream. Was What was it? She like your wife, said Julia. She was, you know, newspeak word, good, thankful, meaning naturally orthodox, incapable of a bad thought. No, I did not know the word, but I know that kind of person, but I know that kind of person, right person. He began telling her the story of his married life, but curiously spread, spread she appeared to know the essential parts of it already. She described to him almost as though she had seen or felt it, the stiffening of Catherine's body as soon as he touched her, the way in which she still seemed to be pushing him with her with all of her strength, even with her arms were clasped tight around him. With Julia, he felt no difficulty in talking about such things. Catherine and Annie, in any case, had long ceased to be a painful memory and became merely a distasteful one. I could have stood in, I could have stood it if it hadn't been for one thing, he said. He told her about the frigid little ceremony that Catherine had forced him to go through on the same night every week. She hated it, but nothing would make her stop doing it. But she used to call it, but you'll never guess. Our duty to the party, said Julia promptly. promptly. How did you know that? I've been at the school too. Sox socks once a month for over for over 16 and in the youth movement they rub it into you for years i dare say it works in a lot of cases but of course you can never tell people are too are such hypocrites she began to enlarge upon the subject with with julia everything came back to her own sexuality as soon as it was touched upon in any way she was capable of grain of great acuteness acuteness Acuteness. Unlike Winston, she had grasped the inner meaning of the sex of the party's sexual puritanism. It was not merely that the sex instinct created a world of its own, which was outside of the party's control and which therefore had to be destroyed if possible. What was more important than a sexual privation, pri privation induced hysteria, which was desirable because it could be informed into war fever and leader worship. The way she put it was, when you make love, you're using up energy. And afterwards, you feel happy and don't give a damn for anything. You can't bear you to feel like, I, they can't bear you to feel like that. They want you to be. Oh. Bursting with energy all the time, all this marching and down up and down and cheering and waving flags is simply sex gone sour. If you're happy inside yourself, 
Why would you get excited, have big brothers and the three year plans and the two minutes of fate and all the rest of the and all the rest of their bloody rot? Okay, okay, great, great. So he says that she discovered the inner meaning of the party's sexual puritanism, or he might just say their 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 strategy of of controlling and utilizing the sexual impulse. He said it was not merely. The, uh, I'll I'll go back here. It. It was not merely that the sex instinct created a world of its own, which was outside the party's control. So think about what he's doing with this diary and getting away from the telescreen and that just page five. The goal is to get outside the party's control to create one space of one one's own because a human being instinctively wants to be free because they want to live in in accord with who who they are and what their desires are if nothing else right so that that's just a, a powerful statement and then he said but there's another a aspect uh and which therefore had to be it had to be destroyed if possible but what was more important was sexual privation that was that sexual privation induced hysteria. What is, what is privation? What is privation? Like not having like... Yeah, um, I, I, I can't think of a synonym right now because um, like deprivation. Yeah. Right? Um, you, you're, you're, res you, you're forced to abstain from it, right? Yeah. And so it's just a basic model of like, um, of a psychological energy uh, that would otherwise have gone into um, physical intimacy that then uh, is, is built up and it's just kind of there. And what do they direct it? What is the regime directed into? If it's not gonna be directed, if all this psychic energy is not gonna be directed toward um, human intimacy. Is going to go to hate. Yeah, hate uh, cu coupled with war. And of course, war is connected with hate in terms of these like bellicose, violent feeling. Talks about a war fever and leader worship, which is that big brother becomes like your substitute object of desire ra rather than the human being next to you, right? Um, this kind of patriarchal image of the, the, the kind of fascist fascist leader and then you know she gives this whole description about you know no one would give two shits about the three-year plans and the two minutes hates and all this nonsense or or big brother um if they were just able to enjoy themselves properly and clearly you realize that you know she's kind of outside the system because she's been able to enjoy herself and gain like what seems to be genuine satis satisfaction it's the one thing she knows about intimately and she may be kind of ignorant about other things or just indifferent to them. But she, I mean, Winston acknowledges she has an understanding of this dynamic better than he does. Um, yeah. Eliester, you go just about one more paragraph and we'll call it a night. Yeah. Where did I leave it? Oh, I think uh, that was very true. Oh yeah, that was very true. He thought that was a that was a direct, intimate connection between cha between chastity and political orthodoxy. For how could he fear the hatred and the lun the lunatic credul credulity credulity which the party needed in its members to be kept at the right pitch, except by bottling down some powerful instinct and using it as a driving force. The sex impulse was dangerous to the party and the party had turned it to account. They had played a similar trick with the instinct of parenthood. The family could not actually be abolished and indeed people were encouraged to be fond of their children in almost an old fashioned way. The children on the other hand were systematically turned against their parents and taught to spy on them and report their deviations. The family had become in effect an extension of the thought police. It was a device by means of which everyone could be surrounded by night and day by informers who knew who knew him intimately. Okay, great. So ultimately their goal is to destroy as much as they can, and they even realize they can't completely do it, to destroy the family. Why, why do they wanna 
do their best to destroy the family. To control them. Yeah, because the family is what? The source of what? Source of togetherness, power. Yeah, absolutely. The source of, you know, incredible uh, human bonds of intimacy that are very hard to break, right? And so here they turn parents, a, a kids against their parents. I mean, God, you see this today, like kids get indoctrinated with all this bullshit and then they come home to their parents and Oh, their parents are this and that and the other thing. Um, I mean, in a very subtle way, a lot of these things, well, let me ask, are, are, are these kinds of things in any way, shape or form happening in our society? Let, let me put it this way. I, I think maybe I asked it, but does our society encourage kind of intimate, wholesome, loving relationships? Omar says no. What do other people think? Pop culture, education. Cynthia agrees with Omar. Okay. So so let, let's let's ask this and we'll call it a night. You would think that our society would be more, I mean, yes, we all want to experience what's out there in the world and to get a taste of all the different flavors and whatnot. We don't want to be prudes or Puritans because that's not cool. Uh, we want to be open-minded and so on and so forth. But what kind of society promotes, I mean, I, I could make a long list of different things in terms of, uh, you know, images of relations of in, in, you know, music videos or film or television. I mean, if we're not promoting kind of basic human solidarity, let's put it that way, because all families are a little different. Like, I mean, isn't that beneficial to society? Why would a society actively cultivate conflict or lack of intimacy between its members? Like, what's the goal of that? Here it's divide, de described very clearly, but of course what we're looking at in this book is a totalitarian regime where we get exactly why they're trying to divide and conquer. Why is this happening in our society? I mean, let's give a brutal example. A little over a year ago, they passed an abortion bill in Albany in the state capital, which was like, um, if the child survives the abortion, you can kill it after it's already been born. And this was much discussed in like Virginia politics and New York politics and a couple of places around the country. like. It seemed rather obscene that they would promote something like that. And you go, you go Google it. I mean, this is not. Um, uh, you, at that point, we we can all get in a debate about when life begins, and there are reasonable differences about that, and so on and so forth. But if a child is out of the womb, and breathing and alive right? And you're making a law that permits you to extinguish its life, to, to murder it or to kill it, if you want to look at it. Um, you know, th that's something that's no longer about just like women's rights to choose or um, them having their lives in their own hands, the, their body, their choice. You're starting to get into some kind of general disregard for human life that's very different than just the issue of abortion. And of course, abortion is tied up with a, with a lot of, you know, some of the dynamics um, 
you know, because of course sex, you know, sex produces children last time most people checked. So um, if you don't want to have a kid, you know, don't, don't uh, just avoid it. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I shouldn't leave it on that down. It's such a, a dark note, but there's something off in our society about the, the extent to which it doesn't promote like kind of the, the basic wholesome and it comes from the media and it comes from academia to some extent and it comes from the government in the laws that it promotes. And um, I mean, uh, throughout human history, every theorist, every, every thinker has said, you know, if you want to have a healthy society, you have to have the strong foundation of like families. Now, now maybe in one society versus another, the conception of the family is a little different, but I mean, the basic notion of human solidarity, I see so much stuff in our media that promotes, um, uh, you know, something that's not like human intimacy. And it's a lot of it's pretty disturbing. Any, any, any thoughts about that? Yeah, I agree. Um, the number one thing that came to my head was um, reality TV <laughs> for some reason. Yeah, it's all catty people in competition with one another, things of that sort. Getting kicked off the island. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't watched a whole lot of reality TV. Anyway, so just consider the way in which this book gives you an insight into way the things that seem to be way out here, political things, distant from your immediate life, your immediate desires, filter in and have an influence or an impact in ways that you might not even imagine, right? Um, I mean, it's part of life, um, being aware of the choices that you actually have at your disposal. If you're not aware of the choices, you, you obviously aren't free to make them. And, um, you know, what's described in this book is really extreme and it's really dramatic, but these things do happen. And, and what that allows for us is to see the phenomena very clearly, but these things do happen in society in, in any society probably, but in much more subtle ways, in, in some ways, maybe less nefarious, but sometimes maybe not. Um, I have my questions about the world we're living in today, which, um, seems to have a lot of strange problems that I can't totally get my head around. All right. Um, so any thoughts, questions, comments before we sign off here? Thank, thank you everybody for hanging in there. I really appreciate that. And I hope, I hope this was interesting for everybody. Professor had a question. Sure. So this is the, the so since this is the last class, we don't have another discussion board after this, right? No, 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 oh, no. Because no. I had seen, like after this one, it showed like week thirteen, and that one was empty. Oh, okay. So I I had um, I had other discussion boards that I left on there, but they they're they're not. No. Okay, so then the only thing that we have left to do other than the, to submit the exam is to do the exit interview, right? Oh, and you know what? I have to tweak that because, yeah. Okay. So I, I'll, I'll send out an email clarifying any any last thing. The, the big thing is, I mean, there, there was one uh, discussion board for, for uh, 1984 and then the final exam. Those, those are the two real things. Okay. Focus on. Okay. And Ellie Esther, thank you for doing such a lovely job. You hung in there wonderfully. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for such a great class, honestly. I was able to follow you because you were so crystal clear in your reading. Oh, thank you. Great. All right, everybody. Thank you. Have a lovely night. Thank you for hanging in there. Bye, everybody. Bye, Professor. Take care. Thank you. Good luck with everything, guys. Thank you. You as well. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Professor. Enjoyed the class. Awesome. Have a great summer. Thank you, you too. Hey, Professor. Yes, Omar. Um, For the rest of the assignments, do you want me to still post it on um, the discussion board or just email it to you?